also to remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. So there have been no apologies received for this morning's meeting. Are members aware of any other apologies? No, thank you. Um, moving on then, members, to chairperson's business. So a number of us met this, uh, met this week with the mother and baby, Magdalene Laundry, uh, an informal meeting with survivors, families and victims of that, of that uh, inquiry. Um, I think it was fair to say it was a very, very harrowing, but a very valuable meeting in the sense that we were able to hear firsthand the impact that, that this uh, disgraceful period of, of uh, and disgraceful way of, of running institutions um, impacted upon people and their, the, the, uh, the continuing impacts that that has on their lives. I'd like to very much thank those who shared those harrowing experiences and I applaud their resolve in, in seeking justice and ensuring that others wouldn't have to go through what they have experienced. So uh, any members at the meeting wish to comment in, the, in relation to that particular meeting? Chair. Go ahead, Paula. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, and, and thank you for facilitating the meeting. I, I think that it was um, really, really worthwhile to hear the first-hand testimonies of, of the victims and survivors. And I think it gives us all a bit of a spur on to really continue to engage with them going forward because it was very clear from what I heard that they are, by and large, all in the, moving in the same direction for a full statutory public inquiry. And I think, given the complexities of the issues that they raised, that I think I, I think I would be supporting supportive of that decision at this stage. Yeah. Um, and I just would would point out to members that we are due to be briefed by the department on that issue on the eleventh of March. So this is clearly an issue that we will continue to have. Um, to have a uh, discussions on both with uh, with those involved in the in the inquiries that are ongoing and also the those victims, survivors, and family members who have been impacted by that. So thank you for that, members. Um, moving on then to the draft minutes, I refer you there, members, to the draft minutes of the meeting of the fourth of February at tab three point one. So we're going back to these meetings because these were not agreed to last week's meeting, as uh, Mr. Chambers raised an issue in relation to procedures. The clerk has confirmed that the procedure was correct and in order. Members were emailed out the details of that yesterday. I would encourage members that if they have any queries on process and procedures, that they discuss it with the clerk at the at an early stage to address those. So are members content with the minutes? Content, Chair. Yeah. Okay, members, thank you. Can I also refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting of 11th of February at tab 3.2? That's our meeting from last week, as normal. Uh, are members content with those minutes? Content. Yes, thank you, members. So, members, there are uh, no matters arising today. So, we can now then, I hope, proceed to our first substantive briefing session this morning, which is part of our COVID-19 disease response. And this this morning we're we're receiving a Department of Health briefing on vulnerable children. Item five is a is a the the members will remember we received this consultation document in September last year. I refer you all there to papers at tab five of your pack. These include the department's original briefing paper and consultation document, and a copy of the Children's Law Centre's response to that consultation. Members will be aware that the Committee for Education considered this matter on the 18th of November. A copy of the official report of the meeting and subsequent correspondence are included at tab 5.4 and 5.5 .5 of the pack. A copy of the official speaking notes for today's briefing is at tab 5.1 of table papers. And I'd also like to draw members' attention to relevant correspondence at tab 10.12 of your pack. So I would now like to welcome to our meeting this morning Ms. Eilish McDaniel, who is Director of Child Care and Family Policy in the Department of Health. Good morning, Eilish. Are you able to hear us there? I, I can, Chair. Good morning. And uh, just check with Clerk. Clerk, do we have Eilish online or do we need to? Good no, morning, Eilish. Yes, no, so I'm hearing you there. Okay, Eilish, thank you. Um, we are also joined by Mr. Mark Lee, who is Director of Mental Health, Disability and Older People within the Department of Health. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Jeff. Thank you, Mark. Mr. Ricky Irwin, Director, Inclusion and Wellbeing in the Department of Education. Good morning, Ricky. Good 
Sorry, not here from Ricky Anderson. If you could bring oh, there anger, Raph Gill up. Yeah. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, is that Ricky? Yes, yes, that's yep. me. Uh, thank you. We're, we're seeing we're seeing Raph Gill there. Good morning, Ricky. We're also joined, I think, by Mr. Morris Leeson, who from Children's Services Planning Professional Health and Social Care Board. Good morning, Morris. Okay, we're going to contact broadcasting just to check on Morris's connection and Miss Geraldine Ta <clears throat> excuse me, Miss Geraldine Teig, who is lead Allied Health Professions Consultant within the Public Health Agency. Good morning, Geraldine. Chair, I don't think we have Geraldine on the call at the minute. Okay. Okay, well listen, we are we are very well represented, I think, you know, in order to make a start. Could I just remind all members of our panel if you could please um, use a headset, if possible, try to ensure that your email is turned off. We know you're all very busy people with uh, constantly pinging email inboxes, which can sometimes be heard. Um, and if you just be conscious of the connections, and we have quite a complicated setup this morning in terms of how many different places we're coming from. So if I could ask the panel members to try to identify who will, who will answer the substantive question that, that members may have, and then... Um, if, if there's any subsequent or additional information that anyone wants to include, if they can indicate it to me, I'll, I'll bring you in on that as well. But if we could if we could seek to have a substantive answer from one person, that's usually easier. And just to ask you all if you have access to a headset, that is also is also something that's easier. So um, I think I think while broadcasting are going ahead there, maybe Eilish, I could go back to you and see: Are you doing the substantive briefing, or is there is there? Could you outline for us how you want to manage that before we move to question and answer session? Okay, Chair. So I, I will um, do the opening um, remarks, and then um, subject to questions that um, members have, and um, other members of the um, panel will come in um, to answer those um, questions, and questions, and we know who will deal. Um, with what? Because we've each got our own area of policy responsibility. Um, so, if, if, do you want me to start then, um, Chair, with the opening remarks? Yes, yes, please go ahead. You're all very welcome. I should have said as well. You're all very, very welcome to meet, and we appreciate your attendance here. And please, yes, Eilish, do go ahead. Okay. So, I just want to thank you, Chair, and I want to thank members of the committee for the opportunity to brief you on the COVID nineteen vulnerable children and young people plan. And um, we want to explain why it was developed um, and to provide some information on the outcome of consultation on the plan. At the outset of the pandemic, a decision was made to collect data relating to children who come to the attention of children's social services on a weekly basis. Our initial concerns were triggered when the number of referrals to children's social services fell in the earliest days of the pandemic. By week commencing the 6th of April, 2020, a weekly average of 646 referrals had fallen to 542. And in discussions with officials in other parts of the UK, we knew that it was a trend that was repeated in all four jurisdictions. That raised questions about the potential for harm to some children and young people who were no longer visible as a result of lockdown and was one of the key reasons why we sought to get vulnerable children into schools. However, the trend reversed rapidly by the 11th of May, the three week rolling average for numbers of referrals was consistently in excess of the average number of referrals received weekly before the pandemic. And this is a trend which, is, um, which was repeated during the circuit breaker, a fall in numbers followed by a spike, and it's now being repeated during the current period of lockdown, making access to school as important as it was back in March or April last year. We moved quite quickly to work um, with the Department of Education to try to get um, children known to social services into school, including looked after children. Health and social care trusts also saw places for some children in childcare, including children who do not in normal circumstances attend childcare. And that wasn't without challenge. The overriding public health message at that stage was to stay at home. And many parents and carers were fearful to allow their children to leave the home as a consequence. Arrangements were also agreed with the police at a very early stage to closely monitor families where domestic violence was known to be an issue. The joint working arrangements between health and education extended to supporting children with special educational needs during lockdown and in preparation for the return to school at the end of August 2020. And I'll say more about those joint working arrangements later. 
However, uncertain about how long the pandemic would last, conscious of the efforts by a number of departments and agencies to support and protect vulnerable children and families, and knowing that we needed a more coordinated cross-departmental interagency inter effort, we sought to pull those efforts together in the form of a Vulnerable Children and Young People's Plan. The plan was developed jointly between the Departments of Health, Education, Justice, Communities and the Economy. The stated aim of the plan is to promote the safety and well-being of children and young people during the COVID-19 pandemic, both within the home environment and within the wider community. It also aims to strengthen system capacity, not only to respond to current challenges and risks, but also to make preparations for the future rebuilding of services, alongside responding to further pandemic surges and associated restrictions as necessary. The plan recognises that there are risks facing children and young people in and outside of the home. It also recognises the pressures on children's services caused by the absence of staff personally impacted by the virus and the need to deliver services in keeping with public health advice. On the definition of vulnerable child, we cast the net widely. It's intended to include children and young people who were receiving support before the pandemic, as well as those who are experiencing increased pressure as a direct result of the pandemic. It includes children known to children's social services, including children on the child protection register, in care, on the edge of care, care leavers, and children placed for adoption. It, it extends to children in receipt of child and adolescent mental health services, those who have a statement of special educational needs, are accessing EOTIS provision or education nurture units. It also includes children not known to a statutory or voluntary and community support service, but who are um, vulnerable because of their, their families under increased pressure due to COVID-19 related circumstances. Asylum seeking and refugee children and children whose parents have no recourse to public funds are also captured by the definition. The plan reflects how services have adapted and enhanced provision to continue to support children and families during the COVID during COVID-19, as well as new actions that have been undertaken specifically to address some of the risks and challenges. A key element of the plan is ensuring that children and families know how to access supports, particularly those that weren't available in the usual way. And this includes promotion of helplines such as the NSPCC helpline and the domestic and sexual abuse helpline, um, which were both advertised across TV, radio and social media early in the pandemic. It also involves signposting families to sources of help, for example, through the family support hubs and through the COVID-19 community helpline. The plan also includes direct supports which have been provided to families, for example, the provision of digital services to support home learning, additional funding to support families where there's domestic violence and support for those who need to access food through additional investment in Fair Share, which is a national network of food distributors. In terms of capacity building, this includes putting in place protective measures to allow staff to deliver key services to families safely, measures to ensure adequate staffing levels are maintained and delivering services in different and innovative ways. The more frequent data collection ensures we have the most up-to-date information on which to base decisions and continue to issue guidance in response to changing circumstances. We also ensured the plan included specific actions focused on the mental health needs of children and young people. And this recognises um, that the pandemic has further exacerbated our poor rates of mental health, including within the children's population. Aligned to the department's COVID mental health response plan published in May 2020, actions including adjusting CAMS delivery models to address immediate priorities and to maintain a level of continuity, as well as development of a range of resource material for children and young people to help manage mental health during COVID-19. The plan was approved by the executive and issued um, on the 18th of September for an eight-week consultation. Um, we received 50 responses from a wide range of organisations, including the voluntary uh, community and faith organisations, statutory organisations, local government, professional bodies, political parties, um, and one of our universities. The responses have been analysed um, by the Department of Health and on behalf of the other departments. Many respondents welcomed the plan and the actions um, in it. The majority of those who responded to the questionnaire agreed with the definition of vulnerable children and young people, with the objectives of the plan and the actions in the plan. 
Respondents identified areas where they felt more could be done. Around 50% of those who responded had concerns that there are needs not being addressed. These included concerns about provision for children with complex needs, including a disability, autism and special educational needs. A number referenced how the loss of routines and support had led to an increase in challenging behaviour. The responses also reflected concerns that children would be disadvantaged educationally in homes where parents are not equipped to support home learning, for example, those with lower literacy or numeracy levels, parents who don't speak English, or because of limited access to a digital device or adequate internet provision. Financial hardship and concerns around the number of families in poverty or being pushed into poverty by the pandemic for the first time were also highlighted. Respondents also referenced the isolation being experienced by vulnerable children and young people and their families. There were comments as well in relation to harm as a result of increased time online, concerns about gaming addictions, the impact of increased on online time on children and young people's mental health, as well as the risks of sexual exploitation. The consultation responses and an analysis of the findings have been shared with other departments so that they can apply the learning to ongoing planning and delivering for vulnerable children and young people during this lockdown and into the future. Under the plan, joint working um, by departments has been facilitated, in particular between the Departments of Health and Education, and that's why Ricky has joined us here today. One example of this has been the development of the Vulnerable Children, and Conting uh, Vulnerable Children Contingency Framework, which has been put in place by both departments, the Health and Social Care Board, the Public Health Agency, and the Education Authority. The framework builds on cross-departmental and agency planning for vulnerable children put in place early in the pandemic, and is the direct response um, to calls for a single COVID-19 multidisciplinary vulnerable children process and feedback from the consultation and other sources on the impact um, of the pandemic and lockdown has had on vulnerable children and their families. For some of our most vulnerable children, the protective factor of routine attendance in school, at school, along with continued access to health and other supports provides a vital public service which helps keep children vulnerable and their families safe and promotes their well-being. The framework aims to ensure that effective education and associated health and social care supports are in place for vulnerable children and young people in circumstances where COVID-related restrictions impact on access to schools. The definition of vulnerable child or young person is drawn from the COVID-19 Vulnerable Children and Young People's Plan. Mm -hmm. At the end of December, the executive decided to move to remote learning and um, for all mainstream education providers, including preschool education settings and primary and post-primary schools. Schools, including special schools, are, are open for vulnerable children and key workers only. The contingency framework has been engaged since January of this year. The framework guides how vulnerable children are identified and supported in partnership with parents and carers and children, both in school or at home, depending on the level of the restriction on school provision. Schools are advised to work with education and health and social care partners to identify vulnerable children, using information already available to them through schools' pastoral care systems and their knowledge of children and, and, and families. It is supported by weekly oversight meetings attended by health and education officials from the Departments of Health and Education, the Education Authority, the Public Health Agency and the Health and Social Care Board. Throughout the pandemic, um, the Department of Education, uh, the Department of Health, the EA, um, the PHA and Health and Social Care staff have continued to work with special schools, um, with the Special Schools Strategic Leadership um, Group um, to put in place additional measures to ensure um, that they are supported. The frequency of meetings was increased with the scale of the challenge at the time. Ministers have now agreed that staff in special schools who are supporting children with the most complex healthcare needs will be offered the COVID-19 vaccine. And while we know that children generally are not at, at increased risk, there are some. these are some of the most vulnerable um, young people. And by vaccinating the special school staff, um, we're protecting those children who may be at a higher risk in health terms if exposed to COVID-19. Both departments have also agreed and announced a PHA proposal to commence weekly asymptomatic testing for special school staff and, and pupils. Testing, um, which will commence this month, will contribute to reducing the rate of infections in special schools, as regular testing will identify cases either before they're symptomatic or asymptomatic in cases, allowing immediate self-isolation, thereby um, potentially um, reducing um, wider transmission 
both within the school and in the contact contact groups of pupils and staff. The planning process enabled us to identify and articulate the risks and challenges experienced by children and families during the pandemic, to identify what departments were doing in response to those risks and challenges, to identify gaps in provision, and to promote new responses. This pandemic has prompted, in some cases out of necessity, services to be delivered in innovative and new ways. It's important that we capture the lessons learned, both good and bad, from this experience and recognise and react to the scale of the challenge for young children and young people and their families. This was an emergency plan chair developed in response to a public health emergency. It was not intended to be, nor, nor is it a substitute for longer term planning under existing strategies, including the children and young people strategy and associated strategies for vulnerable groups of children and young people and or their families. Members should note that the children and young people strategy has now identified the impact of the pandemic as one of the areas of greatest focus going forward. It had already identified many of the children who fall within the definition of um, vulnerable child under the COVID-19 vulnerable children plan as children whose needs require specific attention. For many of those children, um, their needs have been exacerbated by the pandemic, meaning that departments will need to work together in the future, potentially redoubling their efforts to ensure that those needs are met. The key priorities, priority areas identified by the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership, um, which it will take forward over the next planning period, likewise align with key themes of concern um, coming through the Vulnerable Children Planning process and from local and wider research on the impact of the pandemic. They are children's mental health and emotional wellbeing, early intervention support for children with disabilities and their families, support to children whose well-being is being affected by disruption to their school, schooling, contribution to, to, to strategic cross-departmental actions and response to food and fuel poverty, as well as locality-based service responses. Members of the partnership, um, which will include all of the key children's organisations across a range of sectors, will prioritise <coughs> these issues of shared concern, and they have committed to seek opportunities to work together to coordinate activity to address those concerns. And they will also share best practice and share learning. Thank you, Chair, and we're happy to take questions from members at this point. Okay. Thank you, Eilish. I um, appreciate that. And before we go into questions, I do want to declare my own interest in relation to my previous role as a social worker and working indeed within family and child care. And also um, that I that I continue to be on a career break with one of our trusts. So um, I also wanted, before I start, just to, I suppose, reflect the very grave concern of teachers and school staff around all of these issues as well, and they are acutely conscious of that. But I also want to commend the efforts that I know from, from speaking to teachers here locally, the efforts they have gone to to try to fill that gap, to try to keep an eye on children that they think may need extra support, um, and they have managed that through very, very difficult times, I think, to the very best of their ability. So I just would like to acknowledge that as well. So, um, Eilish, first of all, uh, now, there has been a substantial and a, and a very, very uh, detailed and thorough response from the Children's Law Centre. I, I, I want to acknowledge that um, one of the issues that they raise is the definition uh, that, that's used. Um, and they point out that it excludes children who need a social worker, but as a result of uh, ongoing delays, haven't been allocated one. Um, do you recognise that as, a, as an issue, Eilish? Okay, so the, the, the definition um, included children already known to services, but it also um, included children who are not known to services. Um, and, and that was intended to be a catch-all, and, and, and it was a, a, a recognition um, that the pandemic was probably going to impact on families um, previously who have not come to the attention of services um, before. So um, I, I know what the Children's Law Centre has um, said. I think the um, definition is as extensive as it needs to be. I think the issue um, with families that are not known to services is um, if there are if they are experiencing difficulties. Um, ensuring um, that they can access um, help. And, and one of the things that we did um, over the pandemic, and, and we've repeated it several times now, was to raise public awareness 
of some of the challenges being experienced by children and families and um, advising them um, uh, to be vigilant and uh, recommending that they make contact and um, with services if they've got um, concerns about any child or family um, that might be um, in need. Okay, and, and, and what it would not would not appear to be a very logical approach to use, as, as the CLT have pointed out, um, Article 17 of the Children Order, to, to ensure that you have uh, those children who are in hospital, children who are in poverty, why have you decided not to use that definition? So um, the, the definition does include children in need, and that, and that is a reference to um, children in need within the meaning of Article 17, um, Chair. So, um, and, and, and I think we, we have engaged in, in a discussion with CLC on that um, point. So I think it's wrong to suggest that um, the, uh, the definition of, of children in need within, um, within the legislation isn't covered by the definition. It absolutely is. Okay. Okay. Go, moving on then to the equality impact assessment, and um, I do note, I do note that that you have you have said that this is an emergency plan. In in light of the fact that it is an emergency plan, does that not indicate that broader and wider and deeper consultation is is needed and is actually possible as well? Because we do have, you know, all Zoom access to Zoom meetings. We have people. Um, you would, you would think that the people who are engaged in that work would be still able to find other ways to ensure that that equality impact assessment is going on. Now, Children's Law Centre do make some quite uh, telling remarks and, and concerning remarks, I have to say. They have stated that um, that the a full equality impact assessment, they should have been screened and a full equality impact assessment carried out, that the departments have failed in their duty to consult with all stakeholders and in doing so have deprived themselves of the opportunity to be fully informed. And I think that's a key point in that, in that for me, consultation is always an opportunity to take first-hand experience from people on the ground. And the net impact of that worryingly is that they say that uh, acting on partial information, the departments may in fact have exacerbated inequalities for some of the most vulnerable children by diverting resources away from them. So what's your comments on that, Eilish? Please. Oh, okay, so we... we uh... We didn't undertake um, either a screening exercise or an equality impact assessment um, when we initially put um, the plan um, together. And I, I think I've made the point um, that we were required to act quickly um, here. And I think um, I, I think what we did mirrored what was done in other parts of the UK um, too. I, I mean, that was the purpose of consultation eventually, um, which um, was undertaken, granted, um, later in the year. I mean, we did want to see. Um, whether we had actually pitched the, pa the plan correctly and um, whether we were covering all of the risks and challenges um, faced by children and, and, and families and, and whether there was anything more that we needed um, to do. I mean, I think it's wrong to suggest that we weren't using information um, available um, to us in the construction of the plan. You know, so we did work um, closely at, in the very earliest days with organisations like NSPCC um, with Bernardo's um, uh, engaged um, uh, with family support um, hubs to, to get a sense of the issues being faced um, by um, families in those very earliest uh, of days. I mean, one of the things that we did quite quickly um, to um, children in Northern Ireland undertook a parenting um, survey. I think that ran between May and June. And, and very quickly, um, we had um, children in Northern Ireland on a Zoom call, as you suggested, um, Chair, um, with um, senior officials from all of the relevant departments um, uh, attending, um, so that um, they could be made, made aware of, of the key messages coming out of that parenting um, survey. Um, you know, so hands up, Chair, we, we didn't undertake a full screening and a, a exercise or, or a quality impact a, a assessment, yeah. but I think it's wrong to suggest that, that we were acting um, without access to um, evidence um, available to us. Well, I, I appreciate that, and that's that's absolutely as we would expect. However, given that we are now a year into this into this pandemic, and given that that all departments have have indicated that they will learn and implement learning, um, you would expect that the the very important issue of equality screening would now be um, 
addressed more fully. Actually, I think it's more important. I don't think it's it's something that, in, in the current circumstances, I think it needs to be done more rather than less. So I, I think that's an issue, and, and I do notice not you know that that is noted in relation to all departments. Um, it's not just it's not just health, but I think it's very it's crucial that 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 quality uh, impact assessments now do happen and actually are are improved and increased rather than than uh, lessened in any respect. So thanks, Eilish, for that. Anyway, I will now go to members and I'm going to go uh, the order I have at this point in time. I'm going to Paula Bradley Bradshaw. Then Orlea, Flynn, Pam Cameron, Karen Killen, and Jonathan Buckley. So, Paula, please go ahead. Good morning, panel. Thank you very much for coming this morning. Um, the first question relates to the consultation process that you undertook last year. And I'm just wondering um, if the issue of equal protection came up during that as a legislative change. Um, you know, equal protection is really the campaign from NSPCC to remove the defence of reasonable chastisement from the law. Thank you. That's the first question. Well, I, I would need to check the consultation response in, 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 in more detail from memory. Um, I don't think it came up uh, as an issue, but um, I would prefer to actually check the um, responses and, and, the, uh, and the report to make absolutely certain that I'm, I, I'm advising you correctly. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the second issue is also around about putting things into statutory footing, and I, I suppose a lot of the services that have been developed and as you say, maybe adapted and, and continued. Is there any um, plans to put some of this stuff in almost like a legal obligation that, that, that these support services are in place for the children and young people so that going forward, you know, they can have a certain, uh, guaranteed a certain level of protection under the law? Thank you. Okay, so I mean, statutory duties are already um, exist. So um, the chair has already made reference to um, the children order. And, and requirements under the children order relating to children in need, for example. You know, so there are requirements under the children order um, to provide um, services to children and families in, in need. Obviously, statutory duties within the order to relating to the protection of children and to look after um, children. But some of those um, duties, I think, um, already um, exist. Um, uh, you, you know that we're bringing forward um, an adoption and children bill, which will strengthen, I think, some of the protections uh, available um, for some of the most um, vulnerable children, including, for example, um, uh, uh, children who have left um, care by extending provision um, to them for, for, for longer um, periods, etc. Um, so, at the, in, in, in short, I think um, the duties that you you're asking for. I think exist already in current legislation and, and through the adoption of children bill, I think there is a potential um, to strengthen um, some of that. Okay, thank you. I think it meant in terms of the sort of heightened, um, you know, the sort of more robust um, support services that they could um, be privy to or, or could access or be um, provided with. But just then, finally, then, um, have we got a timeline then for when the adoption of children's bill will come before this committee for scrutiny? Okay, Paula, so the, the intention um, is to introduce by the end of March, um, hopefully have um, a first reading completed um, by, um, by the end of March. That's in the plan at the minute and all of the indications at the, at the minute are that we, um, will, uh, will, be, we will be able to do that. Um, if that's the case, then scrutiny by the committee will happen um, after Easter. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And um, so, members, we we will use our normal type of system in terms of um, allocating out time, roughly. So it's around about eight or nine minutes in total that members will have. So I allow members to kind of manage that in themselves. And I'll go then to Orly Flynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Elish. So I just wanted to touch on um, within the plan itself. Um, one of the things that I've been wondering about, so one of the, the action points, it's actually the first action point around how you can, um, you know, maximise the opportunities to get vulnerable children out of their home and into a more safe environment. And obviously the issue around getting them into school and you have, you have listed, um, so the different professionals who can do that identification um, to get kids back into school if, you know, the, the need time in a safer environment. And you've referenced, obviously, social workers, teachers, school nurses and youth workers. 
Um, I'm just wondering practically, you know, how how is that going to work? Um, you know, so if there's if there's children that um, is it down to the teacher? Is it down to the PSNA? Is it down to the youth worker? Who who is actually taking on the sole responsibility to, to reach out to that family or legal guardian to ensure that that child um, can access? Um, the, their their school environment because it just it seems unclear because there's so many different professionals mentioned. So is there one focus on how you're reaching out to those vulnerable kids and have you um assessed the figures currently? So within the past year, do you have the figures of how many vulnerable children have taken up that option? Um, and can you you know can you give the guarantee that all those families have been reached out to so they know that that option is available because some of the feedback that that I've been getting from different families I'm not sure if that's that's been the case and if they're aware of it. Oh, okay, Orlea, thanks very much for your for your question and um, that's exactly the purpose of the contingency framework that I have um, referred to. So this is the joint framework and um, put in place between health and education, um, the purpose of that um, framework is to um, enable children, vulnerable children, um, to get into school in circumstances where restrictions um, apply. Um, the, the, the plan or the framework um, deals with identification, so um, and it indicates that primary responsibility rests with the school, and, and I've addressed that in my opening remarks. I mean, the school know children um, best um, through their pastoral care systems, um, etc. Et, et and, um, you know, we have communicated with health and social care trusts also, the department has, um, making it clear that um, trusts need to engage fully um, with that framework. So that would require social workers to work with schools to ensure that um, vulnerable children know and um, to them um, are, 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 are enabled um, to go to school. Um, and it would also require other health professionals, again, to work with schools to provide um, very vulnerable children with some of the support, the health and social care um, supports that they actually um, require. I mean, I'm going to hand over to Ricky um, at this point because Ricky should be able to provide you um, with some of the, the, the um, data that you've asked for the numbers. But, uh, but I can say that um, the position in the, in the third wave is considerably um, different from it was in the first um, wave, we've got um, a, a considerable greater number of children um, in schools, but Ricky can fill you in um, with the detail earlier. Ricky, do you, do you want to take that, please? Yes, thanks, um, Alish. Uh, so certainly we've seen a much more positive position in terms of school attendance um, since the, the beginning of term, uh, and certainly in terms of uh, vulnerable children and young people attendance. So Alice is right, the schools would have um, primarily the responsibility of reaching out to those children which it deems to be vulnerable uh, and it knows to be vulnerable as well uh, in terms of how they're accessing um, learning. And the framework really is supposed to encourage what's in the best interest of that child. Uh, and if for that child that means um, encouraging attendance in the school, then that's what the uh, school will do. But the school is not alone um, in that. The school will work closely with the Education Authority services. There are various pupil support services who have individual caseloads of vulnerable children. And I'm thinking about the Child Protection Service, the Education Welfare um, Service, children who are looked after, um, children who attend nurture groups uh, and so on. So the EA has been reaching out to those families and those children and sorry, the youth service as well, of course. Um, and just to really make those connections, encourage school attendance and where school attendance is not um, achieved to make sure that there's some form of learning um, in place and that other supports around health and well-being and so on are made available to those families. Um, in terms of numbers, I think during the first wave, uh, we did set up um, a survey process with the schools which were operating at that time. Um, and uh, we asked them to report to us on a, on a regular basis in terms of those that they thought were vulnerable who were in attendance at school. It was fair to say that number was quite low early on in the hundreds. Um, 
now we're in the thousands we're in the two or three thousand um in terms of vulnerable children attendance at school and that would be separate to children who attend special schools special schools of course have been open since the beginning of term all the children who attend special schools would be vulnerable according to the definition because they have a statement of special educational need attendance at special schools since the beginning of term has been in and around 50 percent so that's around 3,000 children there as well so the figures are a, a lot healthier i don't have the exact figures from this week um, with me i wasn't able to get them before i, I came here this morning but i could certainly uh, follow up with those to the committee if if you wanted me to yeah no that that's really helpful um rick thanks very much and the leash and because um, i I'm just wondering, I suppose, the concern that I would have, and I know that the, the special schools, um, you know, that they probably have had more structure in the sense that they have remained, um, you know, opened for, for those vulnerable kids, but it's more so maybe the vulnerable kids who have also have special educational needs and statements, but who are in the mainstream schools. But that's good to know then. So I'm assuming that it's the mainstream schools report back to yourselves. Is that right? To make sure that they are following up on that process for any of their vulnerable children within the mainstream is that right so so what we have is a system where schools obviously have a a, a management a sims it's called it's a computer system where they re would record attendance on a, on a daily basis so we get the results of that we then also have a weekly survey um, where we uh, ask the schools to identify the numbers of vulner vulnerable children who are in school and also who are not in school so we get the results um, of that as well and then we get a weekly report from the education authority um, which is quite a wide-ranging report that goes across maybe 10 to 12 different EA services and they give us detail on the number of um, children and families that they're dealing with the level of contact that they have and also where they have to escalate where they have some concerns and what they've done around around that so th there's quite a lot of data that we get on a, on a regular basis uh, so we are in touch with the system the school system um, on a regular basis we're not uh, you know I wouldn't be in touch with 1100 schools on a weekly basis because it just physically wouldn't be possible but certainly the EA has a, a range of support officers in place um, they're cross organizational link officers they're called colos they are supporting the schools through the pandemic. The special schools then have an additional layer of dedicated support officers from within the EA who are supporting them because of their um, special um, and individual circumstances. So there's quite a strong network of support in place uh, and, and we are monitoring the situation as we, as we go through each week. Okay, thank you. And hopefully that the contingency framework, Elish, as you had outlined, and, and with this plan, that that will obviously help those numbers again to increase. Just finally, a very quick small point to go back to one of the issues that the Chair raised around um, the Children's Law Centre um, flagging up concerns around the, the remit of what a vulnerable child is. Um, and I know um, Colm had mentioned around children who have... Um, who are actually awaiting to be assigned a social worker. So do, do we have, and obviously they don't fall under that under that definition currently, are you aware of how many children would be in, in that situation where they're, so they're possibly, they've been identified as being possibly at risk, they're awaiting to have a social worker assigned to them, but the, they might be picked up within this plan then. Do you have a figure on how many kids that could be impacting on? Okay, so earlier we, we do actually collect information on what we call unallocated um, cases. And, and the first thing that I want to assure you of that there will never be a, a, a case unallocated to a social worker where there are child protection concerns. That will absolutely um, not happen um, at all. Um, I think we, we started um, the year um, with a relatively um, high number of unallocated cases. In March of last year, sorry, it was around 800. Um, uh, that fell consistently through to um, August of um, last year. And unfortunately, it has been on the rise again um, since that. So the, the latest figure that I have before me here is 
um, 711 unallocated cases on the um, 30th of November 2020. One thing that I do want to add is that you know this has been recognised um, by the department as a particular um, problem, and it was one of the reasons why we have um, made an, an additional investment in our family intervention um, team. So around 4.6 million has been um, allocated um, last year um, to those teams, and, and that's to um, a, a enable um, a, additional social workers. Um, to be employed um, within those teams, so around 10 band sevens in, in each of the five um, trusts. Um, we're also putting in um, social work assistant um, support, so the social workers aren't engaging in some of the bureaucratic um, uh, uh, um, work that sometimes they have to become um, involved in. And we've also put um, recruitment um, support um, in place. So we do recognise that it's a, a problem. I want to assure you that no child who um, about whom there are child protection needs will not be allocated um, a social worker. Um, and, and we have made investment um, to try and address the problem. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Orlea. And um, going then to Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Eilish and panel, for your attendance at Health Committee this morning. It's obviously um, it's a very worrying topic uh, dealing with vulnerable children, but uh, I do welcome the, that this um, this uh, emergency plan is a cross departmental piece of work. Um, I wanted to ask in the round um, you referred to um, vulnerable children being uh, known to be at risk in terms of domestic violence and in, in the home. And we understand that, but we also recognise that some children will only have become vulnerable as a result of direct pressures on families uh, resulting from COVID-19. Um, can you outline how the action plan is addressing those children without prior contact with services, making them visible, and perhaps outline how the 29 family support um, hubs are, are meeting the needs of these young people? That's my first one. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to hand over to Mark at this point. Um, Mark leads on domestic violence um, policy, and I might come in with some additional uh, information about some of the um, activities that have been going on and um, within individual and um, trust um, areas. Mark? Sure. So obviously the um, uh, evidence from across the world is seeing rates of domestic violence increase during the, the lockdown periods. Um, and as a result, we've, we've looked to... Um, uh, provide uh, additional funding to some of those agencies that work to support people experiencing domestic violence. So um, there was, uh, I think it was around 60,000 uh, provided to uh, Women's Aid for some of their work supporting um, uh, children and young people. Uh, in addition, we provided some additional funding to the, uh, the domestic violence um, helpline to ensure that they could deal with um, increased calls to some extent, but also they could continue to operate um, uh, even with the requirements for, for social distancing and the like. Um, uh, and more recently, there's been some, some funding signed off for the uh, Men's Advisory um, uh, Project to provide um, uh, psychological uh, counselling for um, uh, male victims of, uh, of domestic violence. Um, we've also um, uh, picked up a, a home office-led um, domestic abuse code word scheme here, working through pharmacies, um, so that um, participating pharmacies, which includes um, Boots uh, Chemist, um, and there are around 95 of these pharmacies in Northern Ireland. Um, individuals can walk in and uh, ask for ask for Annie, and that will be a recognised code word where they will be taken somewhere private uh, and. Um, uh, signposted on to um, uh, appropriate services uh, to support them where, where they're experiencing domestic violence. Um, so those are those are some of the uh, uh, initial um, initiatives that have been taken. There's also PS and I have been kind of leading um, cross cutting work to to look at the impact of um, uh, increased domestic violence and how we uh, how we respond to that and make sure. Um, uh, we continue to maintain kind of awareness across society of the need to to look out for domestic violence, to respond to it, and not to not to look away when we're, when there are concerns that it's happening. Um, so that's a, a range of the kind of um, additional um, actions that have taken place 
um, to respond to some of the domestic finance pressures uh, during the lockdown period. Um, uh, Pam, I, I can add to that, but just to say some of what has been going on um, within um, some um, trust areas. So within the, the Southeastern Trust and the Southern um, Trust, um, they have run a number of um, social media um, campaigns working um, uh, jointly with um, local councils and with the um, Police and the Community Safety um, Partnerships. And it's been done a number of times over the last year, including um, over Christmas, and I think um, that has worked um, quite well. The Southern Trust, again, has worked with a number of local partners, uh, and the purpose um, of that is to try and, um, try and prevent um, issues getting um, out of hand or, or, or escalating. Um, so the Trust has advised that it, it has worked with around 177 families um, up until December um, of this um, year, all for the purpose of, of, of preventing um, domestic violence becoming a particular issue and um, within the family. Okay, um, and thank you both for for that commentary around that. And and obviously, I'm glad to hear that uh, of the the funding to the likes of Women's Aid and to MAP in terms of domestic violence. But it's I think it's really important to remember that domestic violence um, very much affects children, and the witnessing of it and the long term impacts are are huge. And we know. Women's Aid have very good programmes and working with children and um, I imagine there will be a huge fallout from this and there will be more funding required to, to in order to support them to support the children who have been affected especially during this pandemic in particular but uh, my second question um, is um, around the action plan um, I want to know how, how uh, the action plan seeks out the vulnerable children who we would normally expect to uh, be subject of in need referrals and what is the lasting impact of the 30% reduction of referrals since December? Okay, so um, the, the plan um, includes um, within the, the definition of a vulnerable child, um, children um, who um, would be reported to um, social services. So, um, if they are, if, if a referral is made to um, social services, then Pam under under this plan, um, they will be provided with um, services um, deemed to be necessary to meet whatever um, needs needs are, are present um, within um, the families. The family support hubs can also um, assist um, with this. Also, so you know that we've got twenty nine hubs operating um, across um, Northern Ireland and those hubs have continued to provide services um, throughout um, the pandemic um, and, and you know some online services and um, provided um, to families um, to through the children and young people's um, strategic and um, partnership so I, I just want to assure you that we, we are working um, with those um, families in need and, and the referral numbers have um, consistently gone up um Pam um the throughout the pandemic um from from we started to collect um data um the numbers of referrals dropped initially but have continued um to increase um over the course of the pandemic slightly different position with child protection and referrals they have they have risen and and, and and dipped um when schools um closed um for 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 example but, but the, the, the numbers of, of referrals um, relating to children in, in need have consistently been growing um, over the period. But I just want to assure you that um, you know, trusts are picking up those referrals and, and providing um, services um, to those families or referring families to other um, services as, as necessary. Okay, that's very useful. Thank you very much. I suppose that really just does highlight the need to uh, for us to get the kids back to school as, as soon as physically possible, not just for their, um, their, you know, for their educational welfare, but for their physical and mental welfare as well. But thank you for those answers. Thank, thank you, Pam. And I'm going then to Carol Nicholin. Go ahead, Carol, please. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just want to ask a couple of questions. Um, so first of all. Um, I, I do believe we need to have, a, I appreciate the difficulty we're in, but we definitely need to have a full equality impact assessment. And that's the Department of Health rather than screening this stuff out. Um, 
there are clear differences and there are clear inequalities, uh, particularly felt by children, but really vulnerable children. Um, so that's a comment. The other issue I want to ask is that the Children's Law Centre said in their presentation, they raised the issue of chemical constraint or restraints, which is very concerning. So I would just like your views on that. Uh, you will appreciate, and it's mentioned throughout your presentation, that many within the community and voluntary sector, again, I had the privilege of attending Voluntary Pick Roundtable yesterday, and this came up constantly, that without the community and voluntary sector working collectively with the trusts and other partners, that the, 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 these children would have been further um, discriminated against or isolated. So I suppose my concern is the trust are now going from grants to tenders. And if groups, smaller groups within the community and voluntary sector don't have the means for, for example, the big indemnities that are required, they're going to disappear or they're not going to bother applying and will disappear as a result. And they do some of the most outreach and support to some of our most vulnerable children. So I'd like your views on that. And then my last question is, really around a COVID, a COVID recovery plan. I mean, it was very clear from before you picked yesterday that those children who are coming out of care and looked after um, actually experienced more isolation, poor mental health, um, and got moved around and didn't get the support that they felt they needed. It was hit and miss, and that's not something any of us want. So I'd just like some of your comments. And Chair, just before I finish, I I think it would be appropriate to have the Children's Law Centre to come to the committee as well to present. So that's my lot. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Mark, can you, can you take a question about um, chemical restraint, first of all, please? Uh, yeah, absolutely happy to, to say something on um, all of those points, if you want, Eilish, but starting um, with the, the chemical restraint point. So, um, Obviously, prescribed medication is um, often a part of an overall uh, care plan for um, some children, which will look at you know psychological, behavioural, and uh, and environmental approaches, um, and, and it, it can be a very um, effective and, and important part of um, managing um, challenging behaviour um, and minimising risk to um, uh, individual. Obviously, we would expect any med medication in use use of medication to be in consultation with the young person and their, and their parents and um, uh, taking account of their views. Um, we are um, uh, speaking to medical colleagues about how we can have a, a, um, a systematic look um, at the use of um, prescribing um, over the last period and see what impact there has been. Um, uh, but it is, it is important to say, you know, it's. Um, uh, it, it would have been a part of the, the existing treatment regime for many of these people, um, or for many of the children uh, that we're talking about here. Um, uh, and the, the, the context has obviously been a very challenging one with, uh, with lockdowns and changes in routine, uh, and, and that will have had an impact on those children and uh, a requirement to look at um, uh, how we help them manage their behaviour. So medication uh, should have been and will have been uh, recommend, uh, regularly reviewed, uh, looking at side effects, the evidence of benefit, um, and the um, uh, the aim from the clinicians will always be to use the, the minimum dose possible uh, for the shortest period possible. I guess that's the, um, that's the context for some of this, but just to reassure you, we are seeking to have a look and... Um, uh, um, check uh, the use of medication over, over the last period, see if there have been increases in the use of medication, and if so, just confirm that those are, are all um, justified and have been done in the in the right way. Because I think we we are as concerned as you would be at any suggestion there may be overuse uh, of medication as part of care plans. Um, do, do you want me to say something, Eilish, on um, DCS and maybe the mental health support as well, and then you can. Pick up anything additional to Mark, that. Mark, um, you're, you're, Mark, Mark, just if I can, if I can you're, you're breaking up slightly there, so if you just take it slow, um, it's a wee bit hard work, 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 we're following you, but you are breaking up slightly. If there's anything you can do to improve that, go ahead, please. Okay, I'll, I'll slow myself down and please do ask me to repeat myself if um, if you need me to. Um, just to, to, 
two points I'd make around the volume chain community sector and would absolutely agree they've been an absolutely critical part of the response um, uh, to the COVID-19 situation and to providing support to uh, vulnerable young people. One of the things we have done is to, uh, and, we, and we did this very early, was to say to trust that um, you should continue to pay your contracts with the volunteering community sector um, if they aren't delivering um, precisely in line with those. We look to guarantee the income for the volunteering community sector even where, for instance, they had to change their ways of working or they weren't quite delivering the same outcomes. So um, that, that's one important thing we've done to, to recognise the value and importance of those relationships. Um, the second point I would make is that I think the um, uh, COVID-19 crisis has, has really driven a focus on partnership working between the trust and the voluntary, voluntary and community sector much more strongly than before, and certainly speaking to um, uh, groups like ARC, uh, who would rec um, represent a range of um, learning disability providers. I think there's a, a real appetite um, on the VCSI side on the trust to think how we can um, build on some of the really good practice that's been established in terms of that partnership working uh, and really uh, embed that further. So we're, we're going to be taking forward some work with the, the Health and Social Care Board to look at the, the learning around the, the way those partnerships have been strengthened and to uh, to build on those relationships with the voluntary and community sector that um, uh, Then uh, I think th there was also a point around um, mental health and some of the support they've been hit and miss. And it's just it's obviously been um, challenging circumstances for uh, CAMS, for instance, to um, provide uh, support. They've they've looked to do that through changing their ways of working. They've put more support uh, online for people. They've looked to do um, uh, online uh, and over the phone um, uh, engagement. Um, we've um, uh, had specific pieces of uh, work around the impact of COVID-19 on um, building young people's mental health. We've taken action or took action, for instance, for a period to uh, stop transitions uh, to try and provide some stability to young people uh, receiving uh, mental health and support. And there's been a a really important piece of work jointly with the Department for Education, uh, with, with, uh, which Ricky uh, and his team have led on uh, around an emotional health and wellbeing framework for schools, which is really looking to to boost the support um, that, that schools can can provide to, to individuals suffering from um, poor mental health to, to build the resilience of the school population as a whole, to really identify those early opportunities for intervention, to make sure schools are really confident in, in um, how they can support pupils, um, what service they can turn to. Um, and I think we'll be hearing more from um, both the Education and the Health Minister um, on that framework and on, on, on funding for services associated um, uh, with it and new initiatives we'd like to take forward to, to provide additional support for um, young people's uh, mental health and emotional wellbeing through schools. Okay, Carla, if, if I can add in to Mark's input on the voluntary and community sector, and I, I agree fully that um, we rely very much on the support of the voluntary and community um, sector. So the family support hubs that I prefer to um, function um, purely on the basis of, of voluntary and community sector um, support. There are around 600 organisations associated with that um, hub network, and that's a measure of the of the extent to which voluntary and community sector organizations contribute to um, families who need um, some level of support. The, the department also core grants a number of um, voluntary sector organizations, um, Carl, around 67 of them. And um, we did a couple of things last year, recognizing the difficulties of the challenges of the pandemic. So we simplified the application process. We give organizations the flexibility to um, direct some of their funding or some of their efforts towards um, COVID responses. And um, we delayed a call, um, delayed a decision, sorry, um, to make an, op an open call for um, core grant applications for a further year. I'll also say that the minister is currently considering how he might support those um, 67 organizations in the um, current financial year, um, but that, that decision hasn't finally um, being made um, yet. If I can turn then to your comments about children 
um, incur. Um, Carl, I, I want to assure you that we've done everything possible to support children in care during the pandemic, and that's by way of additional funding support, for example, for um, foster carers, um, uh, for children in residential um, care, and we have relied on the voluntary and community sector um, in, in, in those efforts also. So VoIPIC has very much been involved in providing um, advocacy and emotional support um, to some of those um, children and young people. Organisations like Fostering um, Network, um, likewise, have um, provided additional IT um, equipment um, to children in care um, to ensure that uh, every child has access to um, IT equipment. So around 800 pieces of IT equipment have been provided by Fostering Network and around 400 pieces of software also provided um, to children um, in care. So I, I, I quite quite obviously all, all of those children are being supported by their social workers and um, also um, throughout um, the um, pandemic. You. I just want to assure you that we've done everything possible um, to ensure that they are um, fully um, supported. It has been a challenging um, time for them and it has been a challenging time um, for social workers um, also, um, but, 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 but we've done everything possible. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Could we, could we yeah, briefly, yeah, could we also consider VoIPIC coming in with some of those children? Because we're very powerful when we spoke yesterday. And just to say, I don't think anybody set out to exclude or isolate kids, but that's it, the impact. And that's why I definitely think we need a full EKIA on this whole process, this budget process. But thank you. Thank you. So I now have, I'm going now to Jonathan Buckley, then I have Jerry Carroll, and then Alan Chambers uh, indicating at present. So go ahead, uh, Jonathan, please. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks to the panel for their uh, detailed report. I suppose probably the report highlights what many of us have felt throughout uh, COVID-19, that the, those that are most impacted by the, the subsequent restrictions have been our children and young people. Um, it's It's clear it's evident i think we've all been saying that whether we can look at those that are most able in our in our school settings but also as your um, briefing quite adequately highlights especially those children from vulnerable and different backgrounds um i would say that probably we must focus and i think this should focus minds in this report to say that we need to get our children back to, to full-time education as quickly and as safely as possible it's all too easy for politicians or others to suggest closing schools, uh, but we need to look at the knock-on impacts and quite clearly they're, they're evident. Uh, you know, I've been talking to teachers in Mickinson and, and the chairs outlined and they have done a remarkable job to try and be innovative in the way in which they can reach out to children in very difficult circumstances. But they ha there's been limitations and it's limitations for those children are, that are at risk because quite normally whenever children are in school, there's, there's that physical uh, examination by people and observation to see if there's any really in time. I'm not sure I hear something. Sorry. Um, if they see the worrying signs that a child perhaps is vulnerable and they're can, for can report it into the system. But with the home learning element of it, there's been no ability, whether it's via even Zoom call or whether it's through that, this uh, uh, video format, to even uh, have a, a brief observation of how the child is doing. Um, and I know I was wondering if maybe somebody could give me an update as to was there an, an attempt to try and uh, use that sort of video technology that would enable uh, teachers to be reassured as to the welfare of their pupils. That's one thing. I also noticed that um, the, the, I would like to know why hasn't the Department of Health, Health used powers of direction or availed of emergency volunteer schemes to support vulnerable children in special schools during the pandemic? I'll, I'll leave it for there for the moment, sure, but I have a couple more after I've heard back from that. Thank you. I think we've already we've already made the point, and I, and I think you're agreeing. Um, with, with this, Jonathan, uh, 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 how important school is to children, not solely to support their learning, but also to um, provide um, some level of um, safety um, uh, around them and uh, to, to also promote um, their their welfare. And it's one of the reasons why we have consistently tried to get vulnerable children. Um, into school um, over the pandemic, and, and, and Ricky has reflected 
how more successful we have been during the third wave than, than we were um, during um, the first wave, and the, the numbers have um, continued um, to increase um, week on uh, week on week. Um, in, in terms of um, children being um, visible, um, uh, yes, uh, social workers have um, maintained contact um, with children for whom they are responsible using a, a range of um, methods. Now, the preferred method is seeing children um, face to face, um, but if a risk assessment um, determines that that's not um, possible, then social workers will use um, technology to best effect um, to, to to make that um, possible. So there have been examples of um, using Zoom calls, um, et cetera, um, using um, social media, using um, telephone and um, technology, et cetera, just to maintain um, contact um, with children and young people who are vulnerable. But the preferred method is for social um, children um, face to face. And sometimes that's had to happen out of doors um, to um, just simply to make that um, possible. Um, Ricky, do you want to say anything else about special schools other than what we've already said? Yeah. Um... Uh, it's 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 a good question. I think um, the special schools, because their situation has been different this term, the executive, um, in response to concerns from the first um, wave, decided that uh, it would be important that special schools operated uh, as much as normal from the beginning of this term, and that that has been um, the case. Of course, some parents have decided anyway that they, they want to keep their children um, at home, uh, and that is fine. But I think I referenced earlier attendance has been in and around 50%, um, so it's around 3,000 pupils of the special school population. But there has been a significant effort uh, in terms of additional funding and additional support that's been provided to um, the 39 special schools from um, the Department of Education and the Education Authority um, to really support them in maintaining um, their their services as best they can. Um, it has been a challenging time for those special schools. Uh, I have to acknowledge that. Um, there, there have been issues around uh, shortages of staff, um, around fears uh, over them uh, being in school, uh, fears over the virus and, and so on. So we have been working very closely with um, the strategic leadership group of the special schools themselves to work through any issues and, and provide any additional support um, that we can. So um, I think we're learning on that as, as the weeks go by. We, we um, have helpfully been able to put in place a testing regime, which was referred to at the beginning. Um, and we're moving forward now with a, a vaccination program for staff who support um, the clinically extremely vulnerable children um, as well. So uh, as, as we go through this, more and more support uh, is being uh, identified and provided, and we're keeping those lines of communication um, firmly open um, with the special schools to make sure we're doing everything we can. Okay. Well, uh, another, Dan, I appreciate your answers, but um, I suppose while I have noted and through your report how um, getting those vulnerable children into school throughout the waves has has significantly improved. But I I would stress that I, on on speaking regularly with teachers, there is still children that they are worried about that aren't uh, filtering into the school system, unfortunately. Uh, and it's it's becoming very alarming as to you know, not only not only their welfare, but in, indeed further than that uh, in relation to. Uh, their engagement even on the online resource element of it. But another devastating impact has been the impact on mental health, especially for our young people. Are there plans to enhance the child and adolescent mental health service budget as part of medium term planning for increased demand? Because when we come out of this uh, COVID-19 restriction period, you know, I, I think we're only talking the surface as to the serious issues that are going to face society in relation to mental health, and that was, is probably going to be even more acute with our young people. Mark, will you take that? Yeah. Yes, I can say I'll, I'll pick that up. Um, can you, you hear me? Okay. Yes, we're hearing you, Mark. We're hearing you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, so, in terms of additional resources for CAMS, there was um, an additional seven hundred and fifty thousand provided. Uh, uh, 
this financial year, I believe, to to recognise some of the pressures there. And as I um, uh, I mentioned earlier, I think this is, there's there's something around the kind of core uh, CAMS capacity, uh, of which that 750,000 will will um, uh, provide uh, some additional capacity. There's something around the just the, the, the most effective ways of working and, and joined up regional ways of working. So we've been developing a a plan a, a CAMS uh, clinical care network, um, uh, which is uh, noted in the, the mental health um, action plan that was launched um, uh, back in the kind of spring of last year. Um, so that will will look at how we kind of make best use of resources and, and do the most effective things with what we've got. I did, I did also mention there as well the, um, uh, the, the the emotional and mental health wellbeing framework in schools, um, on which um, I think we'll hear more soon um, around some, some of the additional resources uh, that both the Department of Health and the Department of, of uh, Education will be putting into that, looking at um, how we support schools and how we support um, uh, young people with their with their mental health. Um, and as, as far as possible, try, try and intervene early um, and provide support before maybe a, a formal referral to um, CAMS is needed. So um, uh, uh, some additional funding going in, new ways of working being looked at, this uh, framework with education, which I think will be really important, and we'll continue to look um, closely at CAMS. I guess the, the, the other final point just to make is that the mental health strategy, uh, which is currently out for consultation, um, is suggesting a commitment to increase the percentage of the mental health budget which goes to CAMS uh, to bring it more into line with um, uh, the, the kind of 10% average that we would we would expect to see where compared to um, some other comparable countries. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And, and just finally, the, in the briefing paper, the Minister suggests that parents and students have been engaged by the multidisciplinary panels focused on saying Children, it stands in contrast to what the Children's Law Centre is saying. How, how is the input of parents being maximised in decisions that are taken? Morris, I don't know whether you're you're on the call. Um, do you want to say something about reference groups? Uh, yes, uh, it's Morris Leeson from the Health and Social Care Board. Um, in response to the question around the input of parents for the uh, regional uh, health and education interface group that was referred to earlier, we have uh, um, input each week from uh, young people uh, and input each week now from parents. Uh, so we, we're able to, uh, we set up networks where we're able to talk to uh, parents across Northern Ireland, young people across Northern Ireland, identify what their issues are and then bring their issues into the discussions we're having at the, uh, at the regional group. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, going then to uh, Jerry, then Alan, then Chiara. So, Jerry, Chiara, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, yeah, hearing you there, Jerry. Thank you. Um, just a bit of uh, issue with the, with the camera, but uh, glad you can hear me okay. Uh, thanks, panel, for that. A uh, couple of questions. I mean, one observation, first of all, um, the fact that, as Ailey said, 50% of respondents. The, cons the consultation were not happy with the level of services um, uh, being uh, presented is very uh, concerning. Um, and I know a note to the figure around the drop uh, of referrals in, in April uh, of this year, and I think Pam referred to December. But is there a is there a total figure for the total level of, level of referrals uh, that have decreased uh, as a percentage point? Um, from uh, 2020 as, as compared with 2019, because we can take a month here and there, but I think we need to have a, a fuller picture uh, of the drop in referrals. Um, and also, I, I know your, your answers uh, to uh, or Leah uh, in regards to education and the multidisciplinary vulnerable children uh, panels. Um, I got cut off in some of the presentations, so apologies if I missed it. Um, but is there a strategy for when uh, vulnerable children are going to return to school? Because obviously there's there's a strategy or there's a process in place for vulnerable people who have to be in school uh, now. But is there a strategy for when you know people who've been at, at home effectively for a year uh, who are vulnerable and um, going back to school can obviously be very difficult and traumatic. So um, I may have missed it, but is there is there a strategy in place uh, for that? Okay, so um, 
Can I take your question then about um, referral numbers? Um, so the point that we've made is that the, the figure dropped at the start of the pandemic. And I think that's when schools closed and um, children were less visible um, at that stage. But I've also made the point that the number has consistently um, grown over the course of the pandemic. So if I can give you the figure for the week beginning the, the 8th of February, there were 755 children referred to um, social services in that week. And the pre-COVID average, weekly average, um, is 600 or was 646. So you can see that the, the number is quite a bit higher than it, than it was um, pre-COVID and, and it has stayed um, consistently high um, over the course of the pandemic. I've made the point about child protection referrals, that pattern not being quite the same. We've had a, a, a trend of there being a, a, a spike followed by a fall followed by a spike, followed by um, a, a, a fall. And that in the main um, is related to schools um, closing. Um, so when schools close, the numbers go down. When, when, when they reopen, the, the number goes back um, up again. And, and we, we are in, we're in that phase at the minute. I think the, the child protection referral numbers dropped to their lowest level um, around January, around the 11th of January um, of this um, year. Although there has been some um, recovery um, over the course of the last um, couple of weeks um, too, but there's a direct correlation between schools closing and child protection and referrals being made. But the, uh, the other referrals relating to children in need, um, they have consistently grown um, over the period of the pandemic. Okay, and the question just about uh, education, I don't know if that's Eilish or Ricky. Uh, yeah. I'll take that, Elish. Um, Jerry, yes, uh, good question. Um, I suppose the key point to begin with is, of course, that um, vulnerable children, according to the definition, have had access to school uh, you know, throughout. And so that has been our objective, to get as many vulnerable children into um, school for supervised learning. But I think in terms of the broader planning for education restart, we're looking at that now within the department. Um, there has been a, a programme called Engage, which uh, provided funding to all the schools before Christmas um, to support lost learning. So we're looking at the lessons from that and how we can expand that for a new restart programme. Um, we're also looking at options around the summer, uh, what can be done there in terms of providing additional um, support. And I think importantly as well, alongside all of that, um, we need to consider what additional wellbeing support needs to be provided. Mark has been referring to the wellbeing framework, which, which to be fair, we were working on prior to the pandemic. Uh, so what we need to think about is what additional wellbeing support as a result of COVID will be needed. Uh, and I've been engaging recently with Siobhan O'Neill, the uh, mental health champion on that particular issue. Um, we want to work with our education partners on this, of course, the Education Authority, but also school practitioners. We need to get their feedback on um, what sort of strategy do we need to put in place for education restart? What are the levels of support needed and how best are we going to do that? So I can give you that assurance that those conversations are happening now within the department um, and you know, happy to come back at some stage, hopefully in the not too distant future, to give you a bit of an update um, where, we, where we've got to on that. Thank you. Thanks for those replies, and I think it will be useful. Um, I mean, especially, I mean, it's going to be difficult for uh, uh, children who are not vulnerable to return to school, I imagine. So p people who are vulnerable returning to school uh, will be faced with all sorts of challenges. So I suggest and, uh, a, a lot of effort needs to go into, you know, framing that strategy, and I'd appreciate an update uh, on that. Uh, just two final points. I think it is quite concerning that there's... Um, there's no mention of uh, respite services in the consultation. Um, that was quite concerning. Also, um, we heard about mental health uh, previously, but given the, the news this week that 50% uh, of GPs in, in my constituency in West Belfast uh, do not have any in-house counselling or mental health services, I am very, very concerned that you know people who are maybe vulnerable, children now, who very soon um, may be an adult, and will be no longer under the, the care of, of CAMS, 
you know, have a one in two chance of, of seeing or not seeing uh, a GP, um, a GP service in terms of mental health support. So is there any work being done on specifically looking at that and plugging, uh, plugging that gap? Mark, can you take those questions? Yeah, indeed. So um, in terms of that, um, uh, the, the kind of broader mental health support as people move to, to adult services um, and uh, gaps in provision through GP services. I mean, there is the, the mental health strategy, which is out for consultation at the minute, which is looking to uh, generally Im improve um, the mental health of the population and the services that we provide for people. I think we recognise the importance of continuing to roll out the primary care multidisciplinary team model, uh, including the mental health practitioners based in GP practices. There's, a, I think, a commitment in there to looking again at our um, uh, um, uh, psych um, psychological um, uh, services um, strategy. And we um, uh, want to look at how we can uh, expand and improve the, the current psychological therapies hubs um, and the provision that's made through them, because that's a, a, key, a key way of accessing talking therapy. So I um, absolutely recognise the, the challenge that you're setting out, Jerry. I think we've put down some of the things that we would want to do in response to that through the, the mental health strategy in terms of continuing to invest in um, psychological therapies, continuing to roll out additional support in primary care. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Jerry and Mark there. And moving on then to Alan. Alan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I uh, appreciate a strategy is only as good as the ability to deliver it. And I know that the, it, this has bound to have been a hugely challenging time uh, for the department, and I'm sure that the they have not been immune to uh, staff been off self-isolating and, and also they have been affected by the uh, pandemic. But I'm just wondering uh, how uh, have the department, have they managed uh, home visits? And uh, I'm sure that has been a big challenge. And uh, have they been able to manage this issue to be able to maintain uh, their level of service uh, given the, you know, the staff shortages that they, they possibly have had? Second point, really, Ricky and Jerry there I just alluded to, it, but it's around um, the consultees are had identified about homeschooling issues, and uh, I suppose it is easy to identify parents who maybe don't speak English and uh, you know may not have the capacity to homeschool uh, their children, but there'll be an awful lot of other parents who, who don't have the capacity for whatever reason, and they're maybe just too embarrassed to admit that. So will, will there need to be uh, a period uh, at the end of this pandemic to maybe evaluate just where every child is at in relation to their educational development? Uh, because through no fault of their own, um, they, they, they will have, they'll have fallen behind, and that may have implications for their educational development going forward. So with that does need to be identified, and that does need to be dealt with. And I think it'll be a huge challenge. But... Uh, as I say, do, do, does the department feel that, that we will need to do that, evaluate each child individually, both vulnerable and non-vulnerable, uh, to see just where their development is at? Thank you. Oh, okay, Alan, if I can start in response then to your question about um, home visits, and I think this has already been um, touched upon. So home visits are, are, are the, prepared, the preferred way of actually seeing children um, face to face, um, and and that will happen where it can happen. There may be some circumstances um, where it isn't possible, and that's all subject to a risk assessment. If the risk assessment determines that it is not possible, um, then other ways of maintaining contact with that child and that family um, will be established. And I just want to um, assure you um, of that. In terms of staffing, um, then uh, I think within within, so, within social services, uh, when, within children's services, uh, services I'm speaking of, and um, particularly, um, we we didn't have the staffing challenges I think that we anticipated during the first wave of the pandemic, um, but that changed um, during um, the third wave. So we did have more staff out on sick leave or more staff um, having to um, self isolate. In terms of some of the things that we did to compensate um, for that, so you, you know that the department had a, 
a workforce appeal and through that workforce appeal we have um, been able to recruit um, social workers and social care um, workers and I think the plan at the minute is to to put an additional 10 social care workers into each of our health and social care trusts so that that's in train um, at the minute. We did get graduates into the workforce more quickly than we would have done in any in any other um, year and, and when we put those graduates in we did put um, support and, and mentoring um, arrangements um, around them. We have used things like emergency rollers, so staff have agreed to um, participate in emergency rollers. We've used um, AHPs and our children's homes, um, for example, when, when we had difficulties um, staffing um, then and again um, those AHPs um, had some level of wraparound support and, and, and training made available um, to them. We have look, looked at skills mix. Um, so within one of our trusts, um, the South Eastern Trust, the plan, that it's not a plan, it's already happened. Um, the trust has um, employed 21 qualified youth workers um, to work within um, children's um, services. And some trusts have just used different approaches. So within the Belfast um, Trust, within children's disability teams, they've um, developed what they've called a team around the child, uh, and that's in place of traditional caseworker um, models of, of, of working, which means that when a child um, has particular needs that any member of the team um, can pick that child's um, case up and, and deal with it more immediately, instead of waiting until an individual caseworker um, is, is available. I'd just like, to, just like to congratulate you for the uh, how you've dealt with this particular challenge. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So I'm just checking then with Cara. Um, Cara, your hand was raised there as well. Can you, can I check if you have a question? Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, here in the other car, thanks. Fantastic. Look, I'd like to thank the panel um, for coming before us here today. Um, a number of members have touched on uh, a few points I was going to raise, but um, you had mentioned vulnerable children include those who are receiving um, support or have been referred to um, child and adolescent mental health services. So I was just wondering um, on that basis, I know like over the period of COVID-19, We've had, um, you know, children and young people on their phones, their tablets, their laptops. They kind of have that increased risk and exposure um, online. So I'm just curious what kind of cross-departmental uh, steps are being taken to protect children and young people um, from online harm, such as cyberbullying and grooming. Okay, Sarah, I, I, I pick that um, up. So there are a range of supports already um, available. So resources um, do um, exist, some of them available. Um, through NI Direct um, to support um, the children or um, parents deal with online um, challenges. And, and you're quite right. Um, I think children are at greater risk of, of online um, harm because of the pandemic. And, and it's one of the issues that we actually specifically identified um, in the plan as um, something that we needed um, to deal with. One of the other things that the department has done during um, the pandemic, in fact, it's not the, dep the department, it's a cross-departmental strategy. We actually launched the online um, uh, strategy um, last week, the 9th of um, February, um, to coincide with Safe Internet um, Day. So that strategy is now um, in place. Um, we will um, support the implementation of that strategy with um, an investment uh, in... Um, and the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland. So the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland will actually um, take forward um, some of the activity um, under the, the strategy and they will be funded um, to do that. One other, other thing just to draw to your attention that also during the pandemic um, that the, um, the Department of uh, DCMS and the Home Office have actually now published their response to the online harms white paper um, report and, and the proposal is to introduce a duty of care that would apply to um, companies that make them responsible um, for the safety of people who actually use their services, and that includes um, uh, browsing and um, technology. And there will be an independent regulator actually put in place um, to oversee that. I understand that the legislation to make that all possible is going to be introduced in 2021. So, in short, some supports already um, available for children and families. We've just published 
a strategy that's intended to increase those supports and that will be further supported by um, developments taken forward and um, by the UK government. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, my next question um, just refers to, uh, I had seen in the consultation paper there around the Peace for Youth programme. I'm just wondering if you could expand a bit more on what that kind of entails. Thank you. Ricky, can you take that one? Uh, um, I, I would love to, but unfortunately I don't I don't have the detail on that, Cara, so maybe I, I can come back to you on that if that's okay, sorry about that. Nope, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and no problem. And just one last question then. Um, so I had read one of the actions um, is to help with home learning via online resources, which is welcome. Uh, as we know, COVID has had a detrimental impact um, on education, things like rural barriers and digital poverty. But I'm just wondering, um, is there any kind of cross departmental discussion or steps um, on, uh, you know, helping with the cost of broadband and Wi-Fi? So um, I maybe come back in on, on that point. Um, this obviously has been a big issue for the department since the, the beginning of, of the pandemic. And um, there has been an, an additional investment in terms of additional devices and so on, which have been allocated to schools uh, and to various um, vulnerable groups uh, of children. So I think we're at the point now of around 17,700 additional devices um, have been provided. There was also an announcement around Wi-Fi and mobile mobile connectivity for children and young people, particularly in rural um, settings. So there were um, two and a half thousand MiFi um, devices, which is a, a mobile connectivity solution which has been um, provided. Uh, and then there have been Wi-Fi vouchers uh, as well. So. Um, this is something that the department uh, and the EA have been working very hard on uh, and we continue just to monitor and respond to demand um, that comes forward for it. So yeah, we, we want to try and um, keep supporting that as best we can. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you, panel, for, for those answers. Um, there's a couple of... Well, actually, um, Eilish, there's one issue I did want to raise with you today. It's around the digital inequalities. Um, and that covers clearly a number of areas, including broadband, rural broadband, access to devices, access to ability or knowledge or to use the devices effectively. So what steps are being taken to address that issue of digital inequalities? Okay, so Chair, Ricky has partly picked up the response um, to that. So additional um, equipment has been made available um, to priority groups um, and that includes that that includes vulnerable children including um, looked after um, children some of that has been provided by um, by the EA trusts have also made and um, provision and um, fostering network um, supported by the health and social care um, board by way of its contract has also made um, devices available to children in foster care and software um, to children um, in foster care and, and that's all to address the, the digital inequality um, that you are um, referring to. I think one of the things that the pandemic did expose is the extent to which inequality in, in digital terms actually um, exists um, among um, families and probably is something that will need to be addressed by way of um, wider strategy going forward. And, and what is your assessment of the, the access to broadband in, in certain rural areas? So getting onto the highway, you know, having having it, having something to, to operate, it's one thing, but then in terms of rural broadband, do you have any impact, any idea of the impact of how many people might be impacted or have you looked at practical support to, uh, to provide broadband coverage, you know, in, in some other way? So, so my, my is, that, is that covered by that, is that covered by that MIFI that, that was referred to earlier? So I, I think there have been a number of attempts at internet solutions and they include some of the, the technology that Ricky has referred to. So the uh, MIFI devices, dongles, SIM cards, um, BT vouchers, etc., have all been um, made available um, to address um, some of the internet um, difficulties that um, children and families um, might um, have. I, I can't comment on um, particular difficulties within rural um, areas, I'm sure. I, I, it's something we can follow up for you. It, 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 yeah. it, it, I, I think I think that is an important issue because there are obviously um, 
swathes of, of, of areas that, that are that are potentially not able to get on in any form and that, that could be a worry as well. In relation to the chemical restraints, I just wanted to go back on that issue. Can you provide the committee with a with a detailed briefing of how often that has been used, what the increases are, and could you provide that on an ongoing, say on a monthly basis to us, Eilish, in terms of that chemical restraint, because that will be an area of concern, I feel. Okay, I'm, I'm looking to Mark on, on that one, um, Chair, it's within his yeah. area of responsibility, so Mark? Yeah, I know, yeah, we need to think, obviously, Chair, in terms of um, uh, what groups we would want to see captured um, by, by that, if you see what I mean. So, um, if you will go away and uh, and check with colleagues in terms of what information is captured on on what basis and what we could share and come back with a, a proposition for you if that would be okay 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 yeah okay well listen that is that is that is fine i want to thank you all for your for your contribution to our meeting this morning um i know we have mentioned there several times in relation to teachers and school communities and the work there but i also want to acknowledge social workers, the healthcare workers, the voluntary sector, everyone who's contributing, because I think we all recognise that um, it's every, safeguarding is everyone's role here, and, and I think it's crucial that people continue to remain alert to the potential of a child needing assistance or protection. So um, thank you for your attendance here this morning. We will con continue on our consideration of your, your presentation, what further steps we might want to take in this very important area. But I want to thank you and wish you all the very best of luck and uh, stay safe and take care in the time ahead. For my thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, members. So, um, a lot, a lot in there, and a lot, I suppose, of concern and a lot of potential concern within that. So, I suppose, just um, do members want to contribute or come in on anything else there in terms of, in terms sure. of what uh, what we should be thinking? Yes, Carol, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I can't ahead, get any. Carol hands up on this um, so I think it would be good to have a presentation from a children's law centre and VoIPIC which will include some of the children who were impacted you know who are looked after coming out of care the other thing Chair I wonder would it be possible just to write off and ask the department because um, Lee mentioned it as well see the issue of community and voluntary sector a lot of them have been asked to apply to tenders and a lot of them are asked for hundreds of thousands of pounds in reserves, as well as paying for what they're calling um, cyber security and indemnity. It's putting a lot of them out of reach. It's going to exclude the groups that everybody's paying tribute to. And I think it will be really good if we could write to the department and ask for a pause or for a, an update on the tendering process and if it could be paused um, because a lot of these groups that we're talking about are going to go to a wall. Okay. Um, would members be broadly content? I think in relation to the presentation with, with CLC and VoIPIC, we may need to look at an, addition, at an additional session for that, given the pressure on the Forward Work Programme. But I think it is sufficiently important that, that we do, and we could possibly do a, a session where we hear from both, uh, both of those groups. So if members are content with that and also is ready enough to, to ask the department how they're managing the issue of tendering, is that is that the other suggestion, Carol, that you have? Asking the department to provide us a briefing? Yep. I, I have an indication from Jonathan there, Carol. I'll come back to you. Sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. I would be supportive of what Carol has suggested there in relation to those additional briefings. I think this is something that... You know, we, we are, we're only scratching the surface with, really, and we really do need to, to find out a lot more information. Um. You know, I'm conscious of the fact that it's this committee's role to obviously scrutinise the, the COVID-19 regulations. And, you know, we, we have we have been bombarded in relation to every, every week considering regulations, but some of them have such an impact, again, with our other statutory committees. Um, in relation to talking to a teacher, a representative teacher's body or teachers themselves to hear about this very impact that it's had on, on vulnerable children and what their observations are, and I think it would be a powerful testimony for us to hear. That may have already happened at the Education Committee. I'm not sure. I haven't been following that. But I think probably in line with what we've heard today, it would be useful for us in some way, whether it's to see a report maybe that the Education Committee have had or alternatively hear from some of the, the teachers that are experiencing these, maybe special needs teachers, would be useful at this time. 
Yeah, well, we, we, we can ask the clerk to have a look at what the Education Committee has done in this regard that could maybe contribute, and we'll look at that. We'll look at that additional session as to how that might be organised. So, are members broadly content with that? Okay, well, listen, members, I'm going to take a short break there. Um, if we could come back, please, at 11.30. So that'll be a 15-minute break and back at 11.30. Thank you, members, and we suspend the session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, thank you, Clerk. So we are now um, members ready to resume our meeting, and we're going now to um, the next three items now on our agenda are SRs relating to coronavirus restrictions. A departmental official is here to brief the committee today on the provisions of these regulations and to take any questions that you may have. Can I refer members to the papers at tab six to tab eight of your pack? which includes a clerk memo at tab 6.1, and a copy of the principal regulations as amended to the 9th of February at tab 6.2. So I'd now like to welcome to our meeting, Ms. Liz Redmond, who's Director of Population Health. Good morning, Liz, are you able to hear us okay? Good morning, yes, I can hear you, thanks. Um, we, we haven't had much success with the video, so uh, today I'm just dialing in, and thank you very much for uh, amending the time um, because I wasn't available at 11. Okay, so that's that's fine then. Um, and I now just go ahead, Liz, and invite you to go ahead and brief the members, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as usual, I'll take them all together, um, if that's okay with you. So today we're considering mm -hmm. Um, SR 2021-18, 2021 SR 2021-27, 2021 SR 2021-29, which are amendment numbers 2, 3 and 4 of 2021 to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland. So I'll briefly summarise all three of these statutory rules and then be very happy to take any questions members may have. The executive had originally agreed that the current restrictions introduced on the 26th of December would be in place until the 6th of February 2021, subject to a review on the 21st of January. The COVID-19 infection numbers rose very significantly after Christmas, um, with the R value for new positive tests being between 1.5 and 1.9 by Monday, the 5th of January. So this was a consequence of the relaxation to restrictions prior to Christmas and intergenerational mixing over Christmas, which we've talked about before at this committee. At the time of the 21st of January review, there were extreme pressures on the health and social care system. And it was estimated that the third wave was at its peak by then. There had been a very rapid rise in hospital inpatient numbers and ICU bed occupancy with 800 COVID positive inpatients across the system on Monday the 18th of January. That was up from 542 on Monday the 4th of January, so a 48% increase in 14 days. There were also 65 confirmed COVID positive patients in ICU. That was up from... 39 on Monday the 4th of January, so in two weeks that was a 67% increase. Um, and it was actually compared also to a maximum of 51 in ICU in April and a maximum of 52 in ICU in November during the first and second wave. So you can see from that that the picture was escalating very quickly at the time. Um, in addition, in January we had this new variant circulating across the UK um, and there was an increased frequency of detection of this in Northern Ireland by our local sequencing laboratories. Um, this new variant was estimated to be up to 70% more transmissible than the previous variant, so significantly increasing community transmission of the virus. Um, there, there was emerging evidence that the huge pressure um, that the health service was experiencing would not have eased significantly or sufficiently by the 6th of February when the regulations were due to expire to allow any relaxation of the restrictions to take place. Um, 
the executive therefore agreed at this review on the 21st of January that the existing post-Christmas restrictions should remain in place until midnight of the 5th of March with a review taking place on the 18th of February, that's today. So SR 18, amendment number two of 2021, was made at 4.30 p.m. on the 2nd of February. These regulations came into operation on the 3rd of February, 2021, and remain in place today. This SR amends the date that the Department of Health must review the need for restrictions and requirements imposed by regulation three of the principal regulations to on or before the 18th of February 2021. Regulation 3 also amends the expiry date of the principal regulations to midnight on the 5th of March 2021. SR 27, amendment number 3 of 2021, was made at 4 p.m. on the 5th of February at, uh, 2021 and came into operation on the 6th of February and remains in place today. This regulation permits a customer to collect a motability vehicle from a car dealership following an online application. This amendment was made to resolve an issue with the motability scheme that had been brought to our attention. The motability scheme enables uh, individuals to exchange disability benefits for a payment towards a lease on a new vehicle. It's a legal requirement for new motability customers to collect their vehicle, which meant car retailers were unable within the terms of the motability scheme to deliver new vehicles to their motability scheme customers, as they would do for, be able to do for other customers. Restrictions on movement and on non-essential retail at that time prohibited customers from collecting vehicles from car dealerships. This resulted in new scheme users being unable to collect, um, uh, to obtain a motability vehicle which obviously was a disadvantaging um, people with disabilities. Whilst we recognise the need for the current restrictions and the very critical importance of the stay at home message, um, there was no policy intent to disadvantage any motability scheme customer who required a vehicle for essential travel. The CMO's advice was sought and he advised that this was low risk activity if appropriate mitigations were in place. And that's why the, this amendment was made. So finally, the third of the three statutory rules that we're discussing today is SR 29, Amendment Number 4 of 2021. This was made at 2 p.m. on the 9th of February and came into operation on the 10th of February, remaining in place today. This regulation made an exemption to allow the provision of driving instruction by or on behalf of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service Health and Social Care Trust, or the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Board for the purpose of testing of the competence to drive a vehicle. This amendment arose from a request made to us by the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service to allow them to resume driver training and testing for the emergency services. So you'll be aware that under the existing regulations, uh, driving lessons are considered to be close contact services and therefore they're not permitted uh, with an exemption for motorcycles. There was no exemption for emergency services to continue to provide this training. The department recognised that this was also likely to be the case for driving instruction provided by PSNI and the ambulance service. So following receipt and consideration of proposed mitigations from the fire service, PSNI and the ambulance service, this amendment was made to permit driver training to continue for emergency services um, altogether. So I hope that provides you with a summary of the context in which these regulations are made and an outline of their content. I'm happy to take questions and as ever, uh, just bearing in mind that uh, these regulations cross over the responsibilities of many executive departments. So if I'm unable to provide an answer, I'll certainly seek clarification from colleagues subsequent to this meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Liz. And I'm going to go firstly to our Deputy Chair there, Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Liz, for your um, your brief there to committee. Um, obviously, um, we'll be content to support um, these rules and the, the additional discretion for the mobility customers and public services providing driving instruction for their workers is, is very welcome and proportionate in the current climate. Um, I wanted to ask you around um, uh, shops, for instance, and the essential um, shopping. Uh, and I wanted to ask if the department recognises that the online sales are not a substitute for in-person visits to shops, and that's in particular in relation to nursery and baby goods. 
and also to children's footwear. Um, so um, do you recognise that? And are we likely to see a phase opening that will see a move to appointment only services, for instance? And I suppose if you have any update on whether um, there's any indication of click and collect services being uh, made available for those very vital services in terms of um, new mothers and young children. Thank you. Okay, Liz. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you for your questions um, and and for your support. Um, yeah, on on the essential shopping. Um, yeah, that this this is very actively under consideration. Um, so and, and the the very um, services you've talked about with respect to babies, new mothers, um, new parents, um, and and young children are certainly there as as uh, part of the consideration, particularly recognising absolutely that as time moves on, things that may not be essential in the short term can become essential as time ticks by. So um, I can't say any more about it today, but I can tell you that it is under consideration and the concerns you've raised are real and are recognised. Okay, thank thank you for that, Liz, and, and hopefully we'll hear more hopefully later today or in the very near future on that subject. But thank you for that brief. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, and I have an indication then from Jonathan. Go ahead, Jonathan, please. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentation. Um, firstly, do officials have an update in relation to the review of the Assembly's scrutiny of the COVID regulations? Yeah, go ahead, Liz. I don't have an update on that to, to give you today. Apologies. Okay, well, I, I would appreciate that because I suppose that's been a, a fundamental question that's been asked by this committee uh, since I have went, came on to it, and I'm sure long before that. Is it likely that the consolidated regulations will be repealed in order to ensure we start from a clean slate for erasing the regulations as we have previously seen? Um, yes, I it, I recognise. I think we all recognise that we've got now uh, just a, a very highly amended set of regulations, which we made originally back in July, and our intention is, in fact, to um, move to a number three set of regulations um, to consolidate what we have and, and start again, as I think we probably all realise the reality of the next few months is that we are going to be making a lot of amendments as we take a proportionate approach to responding to the evidence as it develops around the disease and obviously um, impact of the restrictions on our lives and the economy. So we're going to be piling more amendments on and we do recognise the need to reset, I think, would be the word I would say there. No, I think it's, it's going to be crucial that this committee plays a, a central role in that, given some of the concerns that we have had on record previously. How will we ensure that inconsistencies in grey areas are minimised when restrictions begin to ease? Well, I, I, I think we've got a lot of experience now. Um, we were certainly learning as we went last year. Um, I don't think anybody had been in this situation before. It was unprecedented. And the rate of change um, and the complexity of these regulations, which, as I said in my introductory comments, span you know, the entire um, breadth of government and society here, so um, we, we will learn from what we experienced last year. We've got some very active um, cross-departmental discussions. Uh, we have an, uh, a meeting that we have every week and have continued to have that meeting, um, a cross-departmental meeting to specifically talk about these things, to try to iron them out. Um, so uh, I, I am very confident that we are learning lessons um, it's not possible to guarantee that there won't be inconsistencies in grey areas in the future just because of the nature of this. And we have to be realistic. It is very complex and it's very unprecedented what we're doing. Um, and uh, as all I can say is that we will be looking out for those things for sure. 
No, I appreciate that. And I appreciate what you've said to my colleague, uh, Pam Cameron, there in relation to click and collect services. Uh, you know, I would, I would actually, so obviously the minister talked about the working group that was set up between the Department of Health and Department of Economy. I would appreciate if you could give us an update as to what the, the final outcome of that was. Uh, and also in relation to uh, those services that are needed are deemed essential, particularly as other restrictions are lifted. And I think particularly of schools in this instance, uh, my colleague Pam has mentioned some of the particular nuances around new mothers, et cetera, and small children. But also, and I have experienced this where um, children are starting new school settings, sometimes vulnerable children, and there's an inability for them to access school clothing uh, because of the, the nature in which those shops have now had to close. Uh, will those particular um, businesses, outlets, be taken into consideration? I'm thinking largely around those that supply school uniforms. I, I'm not in a position to give you the, the outcome or, or an outcome today, but I can tell you that those discussions are very actively going on at the moment. Well, no, I accept what you're saying, but surely, you know, coming before the committee, you would have an update as to what the conversations have been on Click and Collect. I don't think it's acceptable that this discussion has now went on for four or five weeks. In really, or sorry, about three, three, four weeks actively in the assembly, and we still don't have an update on that. Uh, you know, we were told about the working group. What is what is the outcome? What are the challenges that are preventing click and collect uh, to ensure that we have an, an adequate level playing field? And on the other end, will as I've mentioned, I, will you take into consideration uh, the particular nuances of those that are supplying school uniforms? So I don't accept just what you have said there. Well, I, I do appreciate your frustration. I would say that this is a DfE-led piece of policy work uh, that we're inputting into, and ultimately the Department of Health needs to make the regulations or amend the regulations according to what the executive agrees. So, as I say, I, I do appreciate your frustration. I understand why you're expressing those concerns. Um, and I feel I can assure you that those conversations are going on very actively, and um, I, I hope that there will be able to be something said about that. Okay, sure. I'll leave it there. Not that I'm satisfied with the answers that I've got, but I appreciate maybe those discussions are maybe live today for an executive meeting, but uh, the committee has to be given its place as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. And then I have indications from Carol Nikhilin, Jerry Carroll, and Paula Bradshaw. So I'll go firstly to Carol. Go ahead, Carol, please. Okay, thank you for the update on on these ESRs. Um, like Jonathan, I look. I'm I'm only on the committee a few weeks, and I think the committee committee has been very patient and very collegiate in terms of accepting that often these rules come and people are all trying to do the right thing. However, I believe, and it's not this isn't directed at yourselves. I think this is down to the minister that. Um, you know, constantly relying on the committee to uh, accept and look at strategy rules after the fact isn't the way to do it. Questions have been asked and answers aren't given, which isn't satisfactory either. Um, we have asked questions, and I certainly have regarding travel, particularly from areas with people with, like for example, the Kent variant and passenger locator forms. Um, and I appreciate they'll be more forthcoming, but I just want to put it in the record and raising it again. The other issue is, and you will probably appreciate this, um, outdoor training for young kids, even in a social distance way, um, is constantly coming up. It's impacting on the health, mental health of very young children, which wasn't the case before. Um, and I do believe this needs to be discussed, um, as well as even the whole issues around, like, for example, um, uh, detached youth workers um, that you know, can't talk to some very vulnerable um, young young um, adults and youngsters because of these restrictions, um, which we all support. But I, I believe just putting the same things down and expecting the same response um, needs needs to be um, recorded. Uh, I just think that um, while we are supportive as much as we can be, I just believe the committee's um, support has been taken for granted and I'd like to have that recorded. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, any you. comments on that, Liz, please? Oh, sorry. Yes, I, yes, I was going to um, take both of them. Uh, so the first set of comments was really around the process. Um, so what we have is we're using emergency procedure, which has a different set of processes around it than other uh, ways that we make statutory rules, and I'm sure you're all aware of that. And uh, I think the um, question that Jonathan asked about the process, we we will obviously have to look at that, and we, we've been asking questions about that, but there is a process that we have to go through, and the examiner needs to report and so forth. It, it is not the same as what we usually do, because this is an emergency and we're using an emergency procedure. So, um, you, you know, we will respond on that, um, but I'm not able to do that in detail today. Um, on the second part, I yes, I completely hear what you're saying, and it is a great concern to us uh, in health, obviously, because it impacts on people's health. Um, and I would say that there are exempt, exemptions in the regulations to accommodate people who have special needs and the need for care and for mental health support. So they, those uh, allowances are there in the regulation. You're specifically, I think, though, talking about um, the population of young people in general being able to participate in, in sport and outdoor activity. And that is certainly very high on the agenda of discussions that we're having um, in our department and across the piece in terms of looking ahead at where relaxations um, could be made first. So um, it, it's absolutely one of the key considerations. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Liz. And go on then to Jerry Carroll. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Liz. Um, I'm concerned as well as others have expressed about the process. Um, it's been uh, an ongoing endemic problem, um, but also concerned about the possible policy uh, being adopted. Uh, and I suppose, obviously, around the amendment uh, to extend on the restrictions, uh, Liz, um, there's obviously discussions uh, today, a review uh, today of that. Um, and I want to ask, what is the department and CMO uh, and ministers a, a view and advice um, generally speaking because we obviously have heard a lot about R uh, and the R rate coming below one before we consider lifting restrictions but you know in, in reality R could drop but there still could be hundreds of people in hospital as there are uh, at the minute and I'm concerned that there's going to be possibly a plan to lift too soon again when there's too many deaths, too many people hospitalised. Um, so what assurances can we get that that's not going to be the proposed strategy from the department, minister uh, and executive? Um, that's my first point. The second point is on the emergency services um, in terms of the driving um, uh, lessons. Um, how many people uh, is that expected to be? Uh, I would guess it's small numbers, but uh, if it's large numbers, it would be uh, require further scrutiny. So to have a, an assessment or an idea uh, in terms of the numbers uh, uh, proposed to be involved in that. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Liz, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Um, just on the emergency services, uh, this won't be big numbers um, because it's just to make sure there's a continuous flow of new suitably qualified drivers um, for those vehicles we don't want a big interruption to that um, as this is uh, extended into um, a, a longer period than initially had been intended. Um, your initial point then, um, you know, clearly this is a, a point of discussion with the executive um, today, probably right now as we speak. Um, so I, I won't be commenting on that in detail, but the point that you make um, about just because R is less than one means you can lift restrictions is, is a very valid point, which I think most people now understand. If R is less than one and you still have a very high level of occupancy in our hospitals, which we do still have today, um, then you could just, if you ease restrictions, you'll, you could just end up piling more people in behind um, and, and raising the pressure on the hospital system again, which is something we definitely want to avoid. Um, 
We also have not yet reached a level of vaccine cover, vaccination coverage in our community to protect the most vulnerable. So we are very, very wary about this and know that the R value alone, it can't be taken alone. It's necessary, but not sufficient, I think would be my summary. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate you're not going to divulge what's being discussed at the executive or suggested at the executive. But I also think it is concerning that, you know, we're not hearing uh, what are the main principles driving uh, the executive or the minister and the department's uh, approach. So obviously it's to reduce numbers and reduce uh, hospitalisation. But beyond that, uh, what uh, at what stage uh, does the department and the minister see that it's safe uh, to to open and lift restrictions? Because, like I say, my concern is that this is going to be done quickly, too soon. So unless the department and the minister is uh, advising uh, against that with a plan in place, then we're subject to uh, the same problems that were in place uh, last year. So can you give, give us a sense even of the two or three or four or five guiding principles that the department uh, is working on in relation to uh, when it sees fit to lift the restrictions? Yeah, go ahead, Liz. I, I, uh, sorry, yeah, okay. Um, I'll start by saying that the bigger piece, the bigger strategic piece on the sequence in which we lift restrictions is under development. Uh, or should I say it's being refreshed because we did this last year, um, so we're heading into another round where, all being well, we will be lifting the restrictions in sequence. Um, so there is a strategic piece of work um, going on now, um, again, very actively between all government departments led by the executive office with um, ourselves, the Department of Health, feeding into that um, in terms of the health intelligence, if you like. Um, we will, in that piece of work, be revisiting guiding principles and all of those things that you've just covered. So um, you'll hear more about that. But I think you've you've really summarised a lot of them yourself. So we want to know, um, you know, how much pressure is on that hospital system? How much can it bear? Um, that's obviously really critical. And then I mentioned the vaccination coverage is obviously going to be important as well. Just the overall level of immunity in, in the community. We've also got, and, I, and I'm not saying this is a guiding principle, but something very important to mention in this conversation is the threat of the emergence of, of yet more variants and, in fact, variants that are more dangerous to us in that our immunity, whether that's acquired through natural exposure to the virus or through vaccination may not be protective against infection with with a new variant and our um, interim uh, chief scientific advisor um, uh, informs me that if you've got a, a community circulation of the virus as we still have now um, then you've got more chance of getting um, those types of variants emerging because it's a, it's a natural biological process, isn't it, for the virus to select um, or to be selected um, to basically get around our immunity. So, um, you know, I think that that makes a lot of sense. So we need to be very careful um, about those new variants as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, going then to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I might sound a bit repetitious, but um, I do want to come back to the issue of the click and collect. Um, on Saturday, I was in one of our big supermarkets, I'll not name it, um, and I feel a wee bit like you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. Um, but it was absolutely bummed, and it was because a lot of people were calling into the supermarket to collect their flowers and their cards and presents and stuff, and that's because the non-essential retailers were closed. And I'm, I'm concerned that... Um, I, I came home actually and said my husband was like COVID central and I'm concerned that um, the um, information that the contact tracing service will receive going forward in terms of transmission will come from retail and that could then have an impact in terms of consideration for opening other retailers going forward and I think that that would penalise in many ways those small retailers who have not been able to reopen because of that. So we just want to, um, your thoughts on the concentration of people going through our deemed essential um, retail shops at the minute. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you, Liz. Yeah, no, I, well, thank, thanks for those observations and they're valid ones which we need to um, make sure we're mindful of when we're examining the data and uh, looking at what we do next. Um, yeah, I think that's all I can really say about that at this point. Um, thank you. Uh, my second question relates to the driving lessons and tests for the emergency services, and I very, very much welcome that. I think that you know the, the work they've been involved in um, during the pandemic has been so exemplar. I'm just conscious that um, there's also then our health and social care workers who are also waiting to secure their driving test at the minute, and I'm just wondering if it's any special provision going to be made. There was at one point in the pandemic, but that was withdrawn again. And I'm just wondering where the Department of Health is in terms of negotiating with the Department for Infrastructure around that issue. Thank you. Um, I That hasn't come to my attention, actually, as a request. It certainly hasn't reached its way to us as a request for an amendment to the regulation around that. Um, that's not to say there aren't some conversations going on. So. Um, yeah, all I can really say today is that I'm not aware of that being made as a specific request. However, there are potentially other drivers that you could argue would be in a priority area, such as those delivering food to us. So I think the whole issue of um, driver training and driving instruction will, will come around. Um, uh, they are part of the close contact services at the moment in the regulations, the definitions of the regulations. Um, uh, so that, that's why they're required to cease operating. Okay, thank you. And I don't expect a response to this, but just want to put it on your, your radar. I, it just occurs to me that the driving centres where, uh, you know, there's a huge backlog of people waiting to get a test, but would there not be um, the opportunity to introduce like rapid testing so, you know, the way they have it now in the emergency departments, it takes 12 to 15 minutes to get a result, you know, to protect our dri the driving testers. Um, you know, could the people who are trying to take the test, could they not be um, subject to this rapid test before they got in the car? You know, I think that could possibly unlock a lot of the um, blockage in the system around that, around concerns. Thank you. Yes, I think, I mean, there's, there's work streams looking at how rapid testing can be deployed in a lot of realms of our lives and the economy. So, um, yeah, that, that's certainly something that could be looked at. Okay. Okay, thank you, Paul. And Liz, just in relation to some of the things you said there and, and in relation to some of the questions around the whole process, and you'd mentioned the, the very real and the very widely acknowledged threat of new variants. But also in terms of, you had mentioned in, in the course of your contribution around assessments that are made around, for example, and I think this is this is what you said, was that what, what that hospital can bear. But that seems a very, very minimalist approach and a very dangerous approach that we are considering what do we need to do at a minimum to just keep that hospital. And when we talk about hospitals, we're talking obviously about hospital staff. And we have, we have pushed hospitals and frontline health staff beyond what they can bear as a result of this pandemic. So I'm curious now, a year on into this into this pandemic, why we're not looking at what's the maximum we can do to ensure we have the least virus transmission possible, rather than keeping the system right up at a point where it's it's you know assessing where the breaking point is. Why don't we take a maximum suppression, zero COVID, no COVID, whatever whatever approach you, you want to call it. But why is there not more energy at this point in time? I think we all understood at the start that there was, you know, unprecedented circumstances and we were seeking to to uh, manage a very difficult situation. But as time has gone on, the lack of ambition appears to me quite striking, I have to say. And, and while we cannot create invaluable healthcare staff overnight, nurses, doctors, you know, domiciliary care workers, all of these staff, we could employ more contact tracers. We could use maximum suppression there. So, where does that figure in the department's thinking when they're when they're considering what regulations are necessary or what actions they can take? Where is that? Where is that ambition to to seek to suppress COVID nineteen transmission entirely to to the greatest degree possible? 
Okay. Um, well, I would I would say to you that is what we are doing. And I think whilst I might have said what hospitals can bear, I think um, perhaps you've slightly misunderstood what I meant. And um, my my real concern and I, all of our concern is the totality of the capacity of hospitals to deal with not just COVID patients, but non-COVID um, patients. And I think that is a, a growing issue, as I'm sure you're aware, um, in terms of waiting lists and people just being able to access the treatment that they need. Well, that's, a, that's, exactly, that's exactly the point. That, that, that's, exactly, sorry, that's exactly the point that I'm making. The, the point yeah. that, that as a result, as a result of, of allowing or a result of, of increasing sort of transmission rates, then red flag surgeries and other other life saving procedures are potentially at risk. Yes, I, I think um, my point really was to say that I understand that what you're saying, and that perhaps if I said made some reference to what hospitals could bear, I wanted to just make it absolutely clear that I wasn't talking about what is the bare minimum that can be done to stop hospitals being in excess of capacity. I was not saying that at all, and I just want to put that on the record. Um, yeah, and, and I do appreciate it. I'm not, I'm, not, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not directing that at you personally, Liz. But what I'm saying is, there appears to be, there appears to be an overall approach which is based on what do we need to do to keep things below breaking point, rather than what can we do to ensure maximum, uh, maximum suppression of this virus in our community. Well, I, I would just want to contest that because I think we are in fact looking at and in fact doing what we, the maximum that we can do to suppress this virus, that is exactly what we are doing. Um, in, 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 and all of the things that you, all of the tools that you have mentioned, we are deploying. So restrictions, which is the reason that I'm here. Um, we've talked about, uh, you mentioned the, the test track and trace uh, system, which is absolutely, in fact, it's running very well. And the, the lower we can suppress the uh, virus in the community, the better that system is going to work for us. And the restrictions are needed to suppress that uh, community transmission of the virus. We also are doing very well on the vaccination program rollout. Our limit, our limiting factor is not the ability to get a vaccine into people, it's the supply of a vaccine, which is a global issue. And the UK as a whole is doing very well on obtaining supplies. So I actually just want to say that I think we are pressing down very hard and using all the tools available to us. Okay. Okay. Well, um, that that is that is the role of this committee to ensure that that that, that continues to be the case and that that uh, all steps are being taken. That while everyone should be doing everything they can on an individual basis, but the Department of Health have a strategy and have that strategy implemented that that will uh, that will you know um impact on the on the need for this and we're now in, in in a number of series of lockdowns which all of us recognize are very difficult in terms of social and mental health and well-being and economic activity so it's uh, it's it's something i think we we absolutely need to see that that type of maximum uh, strategy being deployed so thank you for that, Liz, and thank you for your attendance here this morning. Um, we will continue on with our um, consideration of each of the SRs, but we can, uh, we, can, we can let you go now, Liz, but thanks for coming along and answering members' questions this morning. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, so we'll now consider each of the SRs in turn, as, no as we normally do. All three of these SRs are subject to confirmatory resolution. And this will be the committee's last opportunity to consider these particular regulations before the debates in the Assembly, which are scheduled for the 22nd of February. So first of all, to uh, SR 2021 forward slash 18, I refer members there to tab six of your pack. I can remind members that this SR amends the date that the Department of Health must review the need for restrictions and requirements imposed by the principal regulations on or before the 18th of February. 2021. This SR also amends the expiry 
expiry date of the principal regulations up to midnight on the 5th of March 2021. The examiner of statutory rules has no issues to raise in respect of this SR. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No, I see no indication there. So if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 2, Regulations 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to SR 2021 forward slash 27. And I refer members to papers at tab 7 of your pack. Can I remind you, members, that this SR provides for exceptions to the restrictions on non-essential retail businesses. The examiner of statutory rules has drawn attention to an issue arising from the drafting of this rule regarding the collection of mobility vehicles, which the department has agreed to amend in future regulations. Have members any further issues to wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? Jonathan? Sure. You know, I just, I just wanted on record, I'm not going to oppose the regulation, but that my concern about the lack of information that we've received around the click and collect services and the equality issue that there seems to be relating to uh, multinationals and small independent retailers. I've been on record saying that now for for a couple of weeks, and I just I don't feel that we've satisfactorily been given answers to both here at the committee. So I just want that in the record. Okay, thank thank you, Jonathan. Um, and if if there are no further issues, then I'll maybe move on to ask members to agree formally that the Committee sure. for Health has considered S or Chair, S or sorry. two thousand. Yes, go ahead. Is that Carol? Yes, sorry, Chair. Um, I would just like to put that concern on record regarding them all. To be honest, even some of the questions that you asked uh, the officials at the end, um, we're we're not getting the answers that we deserve, even if they can't answer, to go away and try and get an answer seems to be lacking. I believe there's equality implications in all these regulations. We all understand that they're an emergency, but um, but the way in which they've been brought forward and the whole process is questionable. So I just want that recorded. Yeah, yeah, members content for that to be recorded as well. Yeah, um, okay, members, thank you for that. So going then to our formal consideration of the SR, the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 27. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions number two, amendment number three, regulations 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed, thank you members. And Finally, in terms of these SRs, then SR 2021 forward slash 29, I refer members to tab 8 of your pack there, members. I remind you that this SR allows for a person to provide driving instruction when that service is provided by or on behalf of the PSNA, the Ambulance Service, NA Fire and Rescue Board for the purpose of testing of competence to drive a vehicle. Have members any further issues to wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No nope. indications. Thank you, members. So then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 29, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions number two, amendment number four, regulations 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Thank you, members. Okay, members, we're moving on then to an item of business this morning, which is an SL1, and the, it's, it's the addition of vitamins, minerals, and other substances amendment regulations NA 2021. And I refer members to the clerk's memo at tab 9.1 of your pack there, and to the SL1 papers at tab 9.2 and 9.3. I can advise members that the Food Standard Agency is proposing to make a statutory rule to amend existing regulations to provide for the enforcement of EU regulations on the addition of vitamins and minerals and of certain other substances to foods. Members will recall that I previously considered this policy proposal in June 2020 and the related SR was considered by the committee at its meeting on the 21st of January this year. However, the rule had to be revoked because of draft errors. 
And this SL1 relates to the new SR, which the FSA intends to now make. There are no changes to the policy objectives from the original SR, which we discussed. So is the committee content that the department makes the statutory rule? Yep, the committee is content. We are great. Thank you. Okay, members, moving on into correspondence. Sure, I had my hand up there. Sorry, so, sorry I didn't see that. Jonathan, yeah. go ahead. No, um, just to put on, on record, I suppose probably there's nobody here to answer questions, that I don't think, from the... Well, it, let me just check with Claire. I think, I think there may be... Uh, Clerk, do we have officials available online to answer questions? Y yes, sure. We're just getting somebody on the on the call now, so hopefully we should have somebody on in a, in a matter of a minute or two. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll just... Uh, pause and wait for that official to come online members and we'll come sure. back to you for your question then john sorry Jason. sure there's um sharon gilmore's on the call now so um okay. we can bring her in okay, okay thank you so, okay yeah yeah no i suppose good, probably just good morning sharon. good morning sharon just just welcome you to your committee i appreciate you being available to answer questions so i uh, I have one question at this point from Jonathan Buckley, and I'll keep an eye out for other members of CPAM Cameron as well. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, no, it's just obviously, um, I remember whenever there were drafting errors with this, and I had some concerns then. So importantly, this rule does not seem to be directly connected with the protocol. However, th there will be wider issues around the manufacturing of food and the potential for regulatory divergence across the UK as we move forward under the current Northern Ireland Protocol, which is extremely worrying and what that implications that will have. So could I just confirm, is it correct that this rule isn't directly linked to the protocol and how could this legislation be impacted by UK divergence moving forward? Okay, what I would say, Chair, is the, the EU regulation does sit within Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, so it is impacted as such. The SR is the, that we are amending is amendment to the 2007 Northern Ireland regulations that implement the EU regulation. In, in England, Wales and Scotland, the retained EU legislation that has been brought in currently parallels the EU regulations that we're seeking to amend. So at this moment in time, the regulations are a mirror image of each other and there is no divergence. So that's not to say that that could not happen in the future, but assurances would be that any changes, the, this particular EU regulation and the GB retained EU regulation set out very con strict conditions for any vitamin, mineral or other substance to be added to any annex in that they have to be authorized and go through a safety assessment before there could be any changes. So in the EU, that would be the European Food Safety Authority and in England, Wales and Scotland and the, um, the United Kingdom, that would be through independent scientific committees. So yes, it is. there is a connection with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Well, I, I would have a lot of concern with this as other parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol and in relation to this is coming forward. So uh, I want to register my concern and I, I, there will be further opportunity to discuss this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And Pam, go ahead, Pam. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Sharon. Uh, Sharon, I just want to ask you a couple of very quick questions. Um, is the parallel legislation in GB already in place? That's the first one. And I wanted to know if uh, you can tell us more about how the Republic's enforcement will, di will differ from Northern Ireland's. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. The, the parallel legislation in GB, yes, is already in place. This particular, and in Republic of Ireland, yes, it's already in place as well. This particular amendment is to bring in line the enforcement um, regime for Article 8 and Annex 3 is to extend the, the enforcement um, that's in our current implementing regulations for 2007. So we're hoping to bring that forward as, as soon as possible. And then all the regulations will be in parallel across both United Kingdom and Ireland, Republic of Ireland and ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I have an indication from Alan Chambers. Go ahead, Alan, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just like Jonathan, I would have concerns around this. Uh, uh, when we had the presentation from the Food Standards Agency, I did ask that in, in the unlikely event of any divergence, uh, who would have primacy of decision making? And I was told it would be the EU scientists that would have the primacy. Um, so I, I certainly have, uh, like Jonathan, uh, I would have major issues with the protocol. 
uh, and would not be supporting anything uh, that was designed to uh, copper fasten any aspect of the uh, protocol, Mr. Chairman. So I want to register that uh, my objections uh, at this point and would not be supporting this at, the, at this particular time. Thank you, Alan. And I have an indication from Carol Nicolin. Go ahead, Carol, please. So um, I would just wonder if the, the, the EU directives still stand and have been put into the protocol to ensure that food standards are adhered to. Is that correct, Sean? Yes, that's correct. Yes. So irrespective of if they were in the protocol or not, the Britain is even going ahead with the EU directives as they stand. That's correct? Yes, all all legislation has gone forward is retained EU legislation, yes. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's good. It would be just, it's a pity that people aren't as vexed about inequality as what they are about constitutional issues. But there you go. That's just my political comment. Yeah. And this particular EU regulation sits within the Nutrition Labelling Composition and Standards Common Framework for United Kingdom. Um, so the framework that was discussed a few weeks ago. So any changes that would happen or any opportunity for divergence from GB would be discussed through the common framework governance of which Northern Ireland is a full participant. So basically there's no change. The EU directives stand as they are and everybody, every, every uh, parliament has signed up to them because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Sharon, can I can I just check with you? So, these these series of of uh, s of of uh, measures are taken essentially to ensure that we don't see divergence from Europe. Which which and, and I'm very conscious here, even in my own constituency, we have a massive food production industry, and divergence could spell ruin for those businesses in terms of trying to operate. A production systems and integrated production system across across the island of Ireland, but also access into into European markets, which I think we all agree that Europe are are famously uh, protective around their food, what makes up their food. Am I correct that that's the purpose of of the SL one? The the SR is about extending the offences um, that for Article Eight and Annex Three of the European Regulation as it, it stands at the moment in Northern Ireland. So it's about extending the Northern Ireland implementing regulation of that EU regulation. Um, it was in two thousand and seven when the regulations were brought into force. Um, Article Eight and Annex Three there were no substances that were prohibited vitamins, minerals, or other substances. So this is an omission that happened in 2007. And this particular SR is extending those enforcement um, regime for the re for that particular offence. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Sharon, members? No, I don't see any other indications. Thank you, Sharon, for, for being on hand and for coming on online and answering and addressing those those questions from members. We can let you go there now and we'll continue on with our Thank consideration. You, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members, so so uh, we, we have uh, on the record from a number of members their concern, but is the committee content that the department makes the statutory rule? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, moving on then to correspondence. Um, can I draw your attention to a number of items there within correspondence? First of all, item 10.2 is an analysis of the responses to the department's continuing healthcare consultation. Members will recall that the committee received a copy of this consultation document in October and agreed to note it pending further scrutiny when the consultation responses were received. The committee also agreed to schedule a briefing session with the department and stakeholders. Um, so, do members have any comments on that at this point in time? Continuing healthcare. Okay, I'm not seeing anything then. So, I think it may be useful to. I, th I thought when reading through the continuing healthcare, and it is a crucial issue, but there was very little information on timeframes and the action plan for how that will be taken forward. Would the committee be content that we write to the department asking for more information on timeframes and action plans? Yes. Sure. And could we also ask, does the department have a COVID recovery plan in relation to this as well? 
um, because this is all kind of set in the context um, of ongoing health, which is grand, but the fact that there's not even a draft or recovery plan is concerning. Yeah, members content with that to be included. Thank you. Okay, then item 10.3 is correspondence from the Minister regarding the launch of the Department's Distance Awareness Scheme, which aims to promote adherence to social distancing and other COVID protection requirements. Um, the letter is seeking the committee support for that scheme. Any comments, members? Yeah. Well, okay, I don't see anything. In I, I thought, it, um, you know, the committee have been fulsome and full square behind supporting public health messages. I think that's that's uh, that is that has been put on the record at every opportunity. So, um, and, and I think we, we certainly would continue to to, uh, to 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 support all those public health measures. But I think we also have indicated to the department that we are extremely keen to see upscaled capacity in terms of the whole fine test trace and the public health measures. So I think it's it's a, it's something of note that the department needs to keep the committee appraised of progress on their responsibilities and, and what it is they're doing to improve the situation moving forward from what we have seen in the past. So I wonder, would members be content, in light of the motion that we brought to the Assembly, would members be content, and I know the Minister touched on it last week, but I think it would be useful to get a detailed, a detailed briefing of how that fine test trace system has been upscaled and what the capacity is within it at the present time. Would members be content with that? Great, yeah. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Chair. Okay. Yes, Pam, were you looking in there on that way? Yes, I was. Yes, thank you. I don't disagree with uh, what you've said there, but I suppose it's... Um, just saying, I mean, we, we don't have any objections to this campaign, obviously, um, but I think, you know, the there is an onus on the department to communicate effectively and uh, uh, let us all understand the need. Um, you know, I think there is a bit of a, a risk of disconnect with the wider public um, on the issue who have already sacrificed so much and don't um, and, and don't and maybe won't clearly understand why the vaccine will take so long to have tangible effects. So I think it's important that the department needs to understand that they need to communicate very, very clearly with with the public to uh, to inform us all of, of what's happening and, and what the processes are and what the, the thought is behind this campaign and why the need. And you know, I think we just need it spelled out more clearly to, to the public and to us um, as to how we're going forward with, with the whole thing. But I don't d disagree with your comments either. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, there was uh, also an item there, 10.13 is a letter from the PVA panel from the Southern Health and Care Trust in relation to vaccinations. Um, just just to note that and um, just to, I suppose, to declare an interest that I have actually worked with that group here in the local constituency, both as part of my social work training and, and I know they're very, very, a very uh, good example of people taking agency into their own hands and impacting on policy. And I think it's, it's, it's great to see groups like that communicating with the committee. So item 10.5, sorry, 10.15 is a response from the Northern Health and Social Care Trust to the committee's request for information on the evidence and modelling used to inform the trust storage plans following the evidence session with some of the trusts in January. Have members any comments in relation to that response? No, it's okay. Chair. Members can have it. Yeah, uh, Pam, is it? Or, yeah, yeah go it's ahead. Pam, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it was just... Um, in relation to that particular issue, it'd be, it'd be interesting um, to know whether the planned activity, the element of the surge modelling is coordinated by trusts or or whether it's coordinated regionally. Um, so really, you know, who's making the final decision on whether um, it's needed to cancel elective surgery, et cetera, it would be good to, to get that information. So could could be right back and maybe I'll get that. Okay, um, and I've also got an indication from Paula. Go ahead, Paula. Uh, Chairmines, in relation to correspondence further on in the um, pack, we want to oh, come back to. Okay, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back to you on that, Paula. Jerry, um, is this in relation to this item in relation to the Northern Trust? Slightly, slightly later, Chair. Slightly okay. later. Um... Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back to you both. Um, 
So have members any comments or proposals on any other items of correspondence? Now, this is not the papers yet. We haven't moved that far, but just in terms of any other uh, piece of correspondence in the in the main pack today. And if sure. not, our members, yeah, sure. go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Sorry, at 10.18, um, like, I think it's in the correspondence uh, pack, um, in regards to the increased uh, support for people who need to self um isolate um from uh, dr kunzman uh and obviously kira fitzpatrick was was talking about this issue quite a lot uh this week um i think it's a it's an important uh intervention it's something that we have um i think talked about in various uh, guises about the need for you know proper um support systems for people to, to isolate so i i think it's it's a positive uh paper um highlighting a problem and a gap um and I think we should write right back to them, thank them for their, their correspondence and 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 welcome their, their findings and, and I would like to see the committee uh, endorse what they have uh, argued for in the in the paper. Well, um, and, and, uh, I, I think that's that's probably would be done in any case in terms of writing back. I note that we have uh, we have suggested here that we forward to the Department of Communities for comment. And maybe if we done that, and then we could come back based on the comments that we get back from communities, we could look at that again. Then, would you be content with that, Jerry? Yes, yeah, so I charge that. So forward it on to communities, and then we'll get a response yeah. back. Forward the communities, yes, forward that correspondence on to communities and get their response back on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you, members. Um, I'm moving on to table correspondence then. So the table pack contains two further items of correspondence. First of all, there's correspondence there from the Minister advising that he plans on introducing the Health and Social Care Bill on the 8th of March. The Minister has supplied an in-confidence briefing uh, of the bill for members and advised that officials are available to brief the committee on the principles of the bill. This briefing is currently scheduled for the 4th of March. And I just want to check there, I have an indication from Chiara. Chiara, are you looking to come in on that bill or are you looking to come in on a previous item? Uh, I was just looking to come in on uh, Correspondence 10.8, but uh, is that okay to do now, or do you want me to wait? Okay, we'll, we'll go quickly back to that, and I'll revert to the, the other item of business. So go to 10.8 then. Uh, apo apologies for that, Chair. No, I just want to speak um, in support of um, Pat Catney's letter on um, surrounding uh, period poverty and the support for uh, pushing for free uh, sanitary products in uh, schools, universities, um, and educational institutions. Um, just to note that um, it's an essential health need and I'm lucky enough to share an office with Pat and I know how passionate he is about this so uh, and it's noted uh, very well across all parties about the impact it can have on education as well and um, so just that I think as a, as a committee we should give that full support thank you yeah yeah and we've indicated there that, that we wish to note that pending introduction of the bill so I think that will return to us as a, as a piece of work for for scrutiny at some point in time Thank you for that. So, members, going back then to table papers, correspondence from the Minister advising the plans on introducing the Health and Social Care Bill on the 8th of March. He has supplied an in-confidence copy of the bill for members and advised that officials are available to brief the committee on the principles, the principles of that bill. And that briefing is currently scheduled for the 4th of March. So, are members content with that? And I think I think we will also need to... We will also need to um, I think get information about what bills are coming because we are going to see a number of substantial pieces of legislation coming and we're going to have to um, go through those in detail. So we clearly need to consider um, how we manage that in terms of our foreign work programme. So no further comments on that then. And moving on then, we've also received a copy of the Severe Fetal Impairment Abortion Amendment Bill and expl Explanatory Memorandum. Uh, the committee will have responsibility for committee stage of this bill if it passes second stage. So um, it has came in very, very late, I have to say, and I, I, was, I think we should defer to next, this to next week and put it back on for next week because I'm conscious it's a very significant issue and that members will want time to consider it. Um, but I, I also think that there's indications then from Paula. Were you looking in? And I'll go to Jerry after, after that. Go ahead, Thank Paula. You. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate that this is not the time maybe to open up the conversation around it, but I just wanted to raise two particular issues. First of all, it says the member is satisfied that the bill is human rights compliant. I wonder, can the committee write to the Northern Ireland Human Rights Committee, uh, sorry, Commission, and ask them for their opinion on human rights compliance? And secondly, when I raised a point of order in the chamber this week with the Speaker during its first reading, 
He said that he was satisfied about the competency of this. The wording of the bill says that it seeks to amend the law. The, the, the law was passed in Westminster and you cannot repeal an act by substantially changing um, the wording in the regulations. And it's my assertion that um, that is what this uh, proposed bill from Paul Given is um, um, seeking to do. So I'm wondering if we can ask the Speaker um, to provide the committee with the legal opinion that he has satisfied himself that this bill is competent, and if it's legally privileged, whether we as a committee can seek our own legal opinion on this, because this is a very, very substantial um, deviation, in my opinion, um, from protocol and standing orders. So two requests, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and also legal opinion. Thank you. Chair. Sure. Okay, I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to uh, yeah, okay, Carol. I have Jerry, Carol, I have Jonathan Buckley, and then I'll come to you, Carol. So yeah. I'm going to go with Jerry, Carol, first. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Paula, for raising it. Uh, I want to support Paula's uh, proposals on, on the writing to the Commission and, and getting her legal advice and, and seeking a copy of the legal advice uh, that was uh, gave, uh, presumably, to the member around this issue. But also, I just want to say, Chair, uh, I know we're coming back to it uh, possibly next week, but uh, in a context where women still can't get uh, abortions uh, in a lot of trust areas, where there's, people are still being forced to travel, where women are being... Uh, made to feel uh, suicidal uh, because they can't get access to uh, pregnancy terminations. I think this bill is uh, is definitely uh, unfortunate in that regard. And also, we're still seeing the minister, the health minister, refuse the act, um, even though he's legally required to do so. He has legal powers to do so um, under the legislation. I, I prefer to see it as a contentious issue, and I think that's uh, that's a real shame. But I'm going to support Paula's uh, proposals as well. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, thank you, Chair. And firstly, can I say I welcome this bill by Paul Given. I think it's an important intervention which will protect life, uh, and in particular, some of the very vulnerable uh, members of our community, including those with uh, severe disabilities. Uh, I just said that I would disagree with Paula's two points, uh, and the. Clerk can maybe keep me right on this, but obviously I know that the Speaker has ruled that this bill is within the legal competence of the Assembly, and I look forward to uh, getting towards that second stage. But the Clerk can maybe confirm that convention is that four weeks after introduction, we have a second stage debate, which is on the general principles of the bill. Normally at committees, there is that there's now a three week gap for this committee to discuss the general principles of the bill. And I know that the bill sponsor, Mr. Paul Gibbon, would be available to come to the committee to give the committee an opportunity to discuss the general principles. I think that is custom and practice, and maybe the clerk can keep us right. But going to uh, if we get, hopefully we can get past second stage, surely then that's the ideal opportunity for detailed scrutiny by this committee. You know, there's an opportunity, obviously, for us to advertise and allow for responses and oral evidence and detailed scrutiny, meaning that uh, the Human Rights Commission and any other body that have an interest in this particular piece of legislation will have the opportunity to put on record their concerns and for this committee to scrutinise that. I think that's something that should be welcome. I don't think there is a fear at all, or we should be not. We should never be holding back from this committee doing its job, which is scrutiny. And I do note. Uh, some that are now questioning the scrutiny and uh, the compliance with this legislation, but they were notably silent when Westminster passed this piece of legislation with no consultation, no scrutiny, with just 17 minutes of debate on an issue of life and death. So I'm open, and I know that the bill sponsor is open, to full scrutiny and engagement to ensure uh, that this committee is adequately equipped to deal with this as it goes through its stages in the Assembly. Thank you, Jonathan. And Charles? Yeah, I, well, first of all, um, I have no issue with the uh, uh, Human Rights Commission. Their view in this, I think that's, you know, reasonable. Uh, the only issue is that, you know, any legal advice is privileged. It's so, I mean, no one has to share that, but certainly you could ask for it. Um, and I would like to see the human rights advice as soon as possible, uh, because you know what we don't need is the proposer of the bill coming to the committee pontificating, um, and I would like to see the the basis of which the legal or the human rights compliance 
from someone else other than the proposer of the bill. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't answered. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm coming back on those, on those, but I want to get views from all members first, and then I'm going to come back on. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making these remarks without prejudice, and uh, I certainly I'm, I'm looking forward to the debate around this bill. I, I think it will be a useful debate. Uh, but just in, in the meantime, uh, just procedurally, uh, and uh, we'll talk about due process. I wonder maybe if, if the clerk could advise if indeed, you know, have we the authority today uh, to be requesting? Is it not? Um, Premature that it hasn't really landed on on our desk yet as such formally. Um, so are we premature in seeking the information that 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 we're seeking? Neither me. I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek it, um, but I'm, I'm just thinking about the timing of it. Is there a right time to ask for it, uh, and is this the right time? So maybe the clerk could give me a, a guide in that. Yeah, thank you, Alan, and I'll be coming to the clerk now very shortly. Jonathan, you were looking back in there. Yeah, no, Chair, I was just basically, I, I thought the clerk would have come back to me directly, but I'm happy for him to come back and clarify what is the normal due process in relation to a private member coming to brief a committee before second stage. Thank you, and Paula. Um, thank you, Chair, for letting me back in. Um, just for Carol's benefit, um, possibly, um, whenever the Attorney General gave some legally privileged um, guidance um, to, or sorry, advice to the Health Minister and the commissioning of the um, abortion services, we were privy to that, but we were provided it in a pa um, past code protected email. So we have had that in the last in the last year. Um, but the reason why I raise it at this stage is because I would like the clerk to investigate whether we can commission our own legal advice, because I don't know what the proposer or sponsor of the bill actually asked for, because you, you'll only get an answer to what you ask for. And my, um, I'm happy to provide the wording to the, the, to the clerk for um, dissemination around the rest of your members as to what I think the, the legal advice should be. And the reason why I'm raising it now is because it may take a few weeks to come back and I don't want us to proceed to second stage or further without having that in front of us. Thank you. So, um, if I could then go, Clerk, to yourself, just in relation to the, there's a number of issues arising. So, there's the suggestion, the proposal that we write to the Human Rights Commission and seek legal advice. And um, Alan has uh, Alan has uh, queried whether that is premature at this point in time. And also Jonathan's question around um, the the normal process at this point in time. Um, and and all of this now, I do want to to state all of this in the context of this significant legislation only coming to us last night in tabled papers. So um Clerk, can you can you can you advise there or do you want do you want us to go into do, do we need to uh, go into closed session to take some of that procedural advice or are you content to address those issues now? Clerk? Sure, I'm, I'm certainly content to address some of the issues that have been raised. I can get um give very clear answers on some of the issues. Some of the issues I might just need to get further clarification on. Um, okay. but certainly in relation to um, the stages of of legislation. Uh, the, the bill is now passed first stage. Um, it'll be down to the business committee to schedule second stage. Um, now it can be it, it, essentially it's up to the business committee to schedule that. Um, so normal process would be that we would the committee would request a briefing from the proposer of the bill um, to allow the committee to um, speak at second stage um, and give it committee's view on the principles of the bill, um, but again, that will be down to the committee to decide when to schedule that. Um, in relation to the, the writing to the Human Rights Commission and requesting legal advice, the committee is entitled to um, request advice from any organisation that, that it wishes to or request legal advice. Um, again, the issue of timing will be down to the committee to decide when's the best time to, to do that and to request that, and the same in relation to requesting a, a briefing from um, the proposal of the bill, it'll be down to the committee to decide the best timing around that. Okay, thank you. Um, are, members, are members content with that as set out by the clerk? Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, no, Chair. Sure. So can the committee clerk um, establish the fact that it is normally four weeks after introduction that the bill is given its second stage business committee pending? 
And if that is the case, that it, have you ever seen a case where the private member is not offered uh, the opportunity to discuss the general principles of the bill at the committee? Have you also have you ever co come across a situation where uh, members of the committee would not allow that private member to to brief the committee? Uh, prior to receiving legal advice from a third party organization. I'm, I'm happy well, to I, I think, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sir. Sorry, Chair. Um, in relation to the timing of the, of the second stage, um, yes, Jonathan, normally, it, it, it usually around four weeks, but it is down to the business committee. And I know that there are a couple of bills there. So for example, I think Jim Alistair's bill was about 68 weeks. The second stage was, I know that there's another um, bill sitting there that it's, I think it's going on um, a number of months um, since, and second stage still hasn't been um, scheduled by business committee. So it, it is purely down to business committee around the timing. Um, as mentioned, best practice advice would be that you do get a briefing from the proposer of the bill um, that allows the committee to make um, comments in relation to the principles of the bill when it comes to second stage. Um, but again, the time and all that will be down to the the committee to okay. to decide on. No, thank okay. You. Well, in, 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 the, in the in the in the interest in the interest of fairness, I think there is. Uh, if we're going to write off to anyone, I think we should also include any of the actions. I'm I'm conscious that we have had a, a discussion, despite this coming in very late. Um, so I, for for me, it would be a matter of agreeing. That uh, if we are if we are going to if the committee agrees that we're going to write to the HRC and to the legal base, we would also seek a uh, request a briefing from the proposer of the, on the principles of the bill. So I think it's a question of timing in relation to we do it all next week or this week. We have a, a, a reasonably good discussion. I think maybe we could go ahead with each of those actions if committees if if members are content. So sure. we request a briefing from the proposer of the bill. We write to the Human Rights Commission and we will a. Uh, Seek seek the legal advice that that uh, the speaker may have and may be willing to share. Go ahead, Paula. And um, thank you, Chair. I, I really am not willing to, or sorry, not not wanting to engage with the sponsor of the bill until we actually have that information in front of us, because I'm not entirely convinced that it's competent and that we should be proceeding with it. Um, after that occasion, I am more than happy for um, Mr. Given to come before us, but at the minute, I am not satisfied that it is human rights compliant and that it would not amend the primary legislation. And I don't think that the Northern Ireland Assembly has the ability to repeal a primary piece of le legislation from the sover sovereign parliament. Sure. Okay, um, I'm going to go to the clerk first just in relation to that issue, then I'll go to Jonathan, then I have Pam, and I also have Alan. So in relation to in relation to the process that Paula's uh, query in there, Clerk, can you advise, please? Um, certainly. I'm, I'm waiting just some further clarification from um, Bill Clarks in relation to the issue of competence um, and what is decided at first stage when the bill is introduced. So as soon as I get confirmation on that, I will advise members of that. Um, and as, as I've said before, in relation to timing of, of briefings, it is at the committee's discretion. Um, and it's for the committee to decide when's the best time to be briefed um, by the by the proposer of the bill. Okay, thank you, Clark. So we're going to go to Jonathan, then Pam, then then Jerry. Chair, sure. firstly, I think I think the first part of your proposal is a very very sensible approach that we write to the the bill sponsor to a request that he comes before the committee to discuss the general principles. I think that's first and foremost uh, a very, very um, competent way in which this committee should do its business. Uh, on the second part regarding the Human Rights Commission, I have absolutely no problem whatsoever. I have no doubt that the Human Rights Commission will have a part to play. We, they'll be before the committee, they'll have a part to play in relation to their views and comments around this. But I do not believe, and I would, I would probably, in, in relation to that part of your uh, proposal, I would like the clerk to give further information as to whether or not that is something that should be done prior to hearing the general principles or whether that's custom and practice that, that happens. And on, on Paula's points, like I, I can't believe really what I'm hearing. So the, the speaker in, her point of or, in his point of order to Paula suggested that this was within the legal competence of the Assembly. And I, I think it's extremely disingenuous that uh, Paula would point out uh, that 
you know, she is not willing to hear from the bill's sponsor before she receives such advice. I, I think I think that's madness, given the fact that the speaker has already ruled that it is within the competence. Uh, you know, this tick personalities out of this. This look at the uh, the bill as as a whole in which it's representing itself. Members and other organisations will have many views on that, and they'll be given an opportunity to do so. Uh, detailed or committee stage where all members will have their views uh, on the record. But I, I think it's an extremely uh, dangerous road to go down that we are blocking a, a private member from j discussing the general principles of the bill before uh, the second stage, therefore denying this committee the opportunity to fully uh, engage with the bill as it goes through this process. Uh, Pam, then Alan, then Jerry. Thanks, Chair. And obviously, I do support uh, my colleague uh, Jonathan Buckley's comments there. Um, and I also very much welcome the introduction of this bill, uh, as have uh, hundreds of people who have contacted me over the last few days uh, are also uh, very welcoming of this introduction of this bill. Um, I think in terms of Paula's point uh, on the Speaker's ruling, I just think we need to be wary that we as a committee are not challenging the ruler of the Speaker. So. Again, I think we would need the clerk to further advise us because um, I don't think that would be in any way appropriate. So uh, perhaps um, Keith could advise us further on that. Okay, Alan. Uh, that, that is exactly the point I was going to make, uh, Chair, that Pam has just made, that you know, certainly uh, Paula is perfectly entitled to have an opinion on the competency of, of the bill. She's also entitled to, uh, if she wishes to go down that road, to, to challenge the, the, the ruling of the Speaker. But I wouldn't be comfortable with the committee uh, corporately being seen uh, to uh, challenge the Speaker's ruling at this point. So, uh, you know, there is a bit of a, a conundrum here. Chair, can I come in quickly? Um, Jerry. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, Jerry. no, I'm going, I'm going to go to Jerry, Carl, then, then Carl, Michael, and then I'll come back to you then, Paula. Jerry. Yeah, thanks, thanks Chair. Um, yeah, listen, I obviously, you know, don't support the bill. Um, and, and obviously, if it's going to proceed, that I would like to sort of ask questions and, and challenge the, the proposer of it. Um, but I think that kind of uh, probably makes makes sense after we, we do get some clarity on the the, the legal position of it, I not to question the speaker or, any, or anybody, but I think there's been some concern about um, this bill. Um, so I think it would be important that before we proceed and before we uh, question that we just get a bit of clarity uh, on that. That would be my preferred approach. And um, Cheryl? Yeah, I, I do think we need to get clarity. Um, but the issue for me is, so first of all, I think... I support the the issue that Paul has raised in terms of getting the Human Rights Commission in. Um, so before we um, bring Paul Gibbon in, the other issue, rather than that, rather than the, because it's going to go down a rabbit hole, in my opinion, about the competency of whatever there's already written in that, I would much prefer to get a legal opinion in about the issues that you raised regarding Westminster and that. I think Paula. I'd be much more comfortable doing that. It's not because my colleague's a speaker. It's just that I, I, I think it will suck precious time and energy away that we need to focus on um, this bill being brought when the, the um, legislation was made in Westminster, um, given the fact that there was a denial of, of uh, reproductive rights for women here. So, Okay. Okay, I'm going. I'm going to go to Paula then quickly to Cara, and then I'm going to go back to the clerk for some more clarity in terms of competence. So I'm going to Cara Hunter. Go ahead, Cara. Um, I didn't indicate, Chair. Sorry. Okay, Cara, that's fine. Uh, Paula, go ahead. Well, I'd just like to put on record apologies to the speaker. I wasn't trying to question his integrity, and that's why I would like the legal advice. So I retract that statement, but I would like to see the legal advice that he has been presented with that made. The ruling that it was legally competent in, our, in the assembly. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, clerk, first of all, can you advise? Is it is it uh, in order for us to seek the legal advice that the that the speaker has? And can you then provide some further clarity around the competence issue, please? Thank you, um, so, certainly, chair. Um, in relation to the process uh, before a bill is introduced, the speaker will send it to the assembly's legal services to consider competence. So um, the 
the fact that it was introduced at first stage means that the speaker was content um, that it was within the um, competence of the assembly and there is a statement on the cover of the bill that outlined this um, in relation to seeking um, a copy of the, the legal advice um, certainly the committee can request it um, whether it'll be forthcoming or not I, I couldn't comment Chair okay. Ken, thank you. Um, who is looking in there? I'm not going to draw this to a close yeah, now. Uh, I was going to say, if, if that was, and I think if I'm reading right what Paul has said, and maybe Carol and yourself, if it is a request for to, to ask the Speaker for the advice that he, he was given, I have no problem with that. I think that's, I, I'm happy for the committee to do that. Uh, and also the original part of your opening uh, proposal, which was that we also write to the private bill sponsor regarding our intention to hear from him before second stage. So if that was what was said, I, I'm more than happy with that proposal. And, and we would also write to the Human Rights Commission, and I think members are indicating that they would like to hear from the Human Rights Commission prior to the sponsor of the bill. And I think Clerk is indicating that that would be in order. Is that right, Clerk? Uh, it's down to the committee to decide the, the order that it wishes to undertake business. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so our members can tell without a problem. On that point, I, I don't know whether or not that is something that has been done before. I, I, I'm certainly not saying that we have to hear from the Human Rights Commission before the private uh, bill sponsor would come before the committee. If if that can be done, you know, I don't think it should be a hold on holding back the potential for the private member to come before the committee, given the fact being, albeit yes, it's down to the business committee. But if the third, if the second reading is within four weeks uh, from whenever this was laid, this gives us in the region of just over three weeks. So it is important that we hear from the private uh, member, uh, Mr. Paul Given, in relation to this bill to inform us before second stage, well, because after second stage and goes to committee stage, the Human Rights Commission will have a central role in coming before the committee. Okay. Um, now, the clerk has indicated that, that that's at the discretion of the business committee that four weeks, that that has been longer in recent times and could be longer. What I propose is that we take that course of action and we then next week decide in terms of scheduling. It will be up to the committee when we schedule in the various, the various contributions. So I think if we do the three stages that we have indicated there, and next week then we can consider when we schedule those. That is down to the choice of the committee members. So we can have another discussion um, as to how we schedule that in and indeed how we schedule in around all of the forward work programme that we have in front of us. So are members content with that approach? Yeah, okay. Okay, Claire, are you content that you have the, the instructions clearly enough? Yes, sir, content. Chair, okay. can I just check? Um, the legal advice that I would, would be seeking is around the human rights compliance it's not necessarily, you know, in terms of how you get from CEDAW to Westminster and the Supreme Court judgment to Westminster and then the regulations are written. So I think that I just want to be clear about that. If the, if the legal advice that we see coming back from the Speaker's office is not clear enough about that, I still would like to have the proposal on the table that we seek our own legal advice around human rights compliance. So I, I, yeah. I don't want to... And we could yes, we could come back. To, we could come back to that, Paul. And we could, depending on how how what the legal advice is, or if we indeed get the legal advice, we can then make a full decision on do any any additional advice we would wish to seek. So yeah. we can do that. We we'll do that at a, at a later point, based on yeah. based on what we're receiving. I just on Paula's point there, I wouldn't be in agreement with what she is saying there. First of all, it's about the competence of the bill to allow then us to go through uh, formality in relation to the private member giving his uh, assessment of general principles. Paula's argument around the human rights compliance issue, that's going to be a crucial part of her argument at committee stage. So I think it will be very wrong for the committee to take a prejudiced opinion or legal advice before we even get to that stage. Well, the committee can discuss and, and decide what it wishes to do when it comes to that, when it comes to that point. Okay, members, um, I think we're, we're content there that we have uh, charted a way forward. So um, I'm moving on then to our forward work programme. Are members content to note the forward work programme as contained in your papers? Yeah, members content. Any other business members then? Do members have any other business? No indications on that, members. Thank you. Yeah, sure. who am I here? 
Yeah, is that Carol? Yes, it Where is. Sure? Just the issue was raised last week um, by Alan Chambers regarding um, the conversion therapy. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, was there an opportunity to go through the recordings of that? Because, there, you know, there was some fairly heavy laden allegations made that were supported by Pam as well. So, and, you know, in fairness of uh, openness and social justice, I would like to see if there's any more response to that. Okay. Um, well, Carol, that did arise in, in the minutes, and I know you were having difficulty at the start of the meeting getting on. Um, I'll just... I'll just uh, I'll just, I'll just indicate that, um, let me get it here in the minutes. So, yeah, the, the, the minutes of the last meeting haven't been agreed. They have been agreed now to, at today's meeting, uh, but it, it has stated that Mr. Chambers raised an issue in relation to procedures. The clerk has confirmed that the procedure was correct and in order. Members were emailed out yesterday with the details. And the clerk had, had it said that he would encourage members to if they have queries on process and procedure that they discuss with the clerk at an early stage. So that was addressed during the minutes, Carol. Okay. So uh, thanks, for that, Chair. Apologies, I couldn't get into the start. I just wanted to make sure it was covered. Sure. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Yes. Two two points. Uh, number one was on the relation to the item of business today on the SL one the addition of vitamins, minerals, and other substance amendment. Uh, just to notify the clerk, I, I do have some more technical questions that I would like to put through to you, and I will do so via email later today in relation to that. So it's just to put that on record. And the other one was, uh, I think it was Carol mentioned earlier in, in relation to the regulations. I, I probably like her, have had a lot of representation from those that are concerned regarding young people and the denial of sports, et cetera, to their mental well-being and physical well-being. It's something that I'm getting lobbied on quite heavily now. I don't know if other members are, and I would be interested to hear a further, a deeper analysis and opinion from the department as to that adverse impact. Uh, and I would I would ask the committee's support in, in writing to uh, the department to, to seek that. Yeah, are you, Clerk, are you clear enough on that? Are members agreed with that? And also, Clerk, uh, can, can you advise those questions of Jonathan will be shared with the entire committee? Is that correct, process? Yep, yep, Chair, that's, I can certainly share that with the, the committee and then pass them on to the FSA. Um, the, to get a response on in relation to the the sport um young people and, and children in sport we did have an item of correspondence last week which we forwarded to the department um for comment um so we are currently waiting a response on that but we can certainly highlight that it was raised again today um and get a response on that as quickly as we can sure okay and having it yes jerry go ahead so just a separate point, Chair. Just uh, I think the meeting this week with the uh, victims and survivors was, was very, very important. Uh, and, and thanks to yourself and the, the team for putting it together. And, and I think obviously, you know, it goes without saying, but I think we'll need to uh, do a bit of work on the um, the, the call and scrutinising uh, the possible terms of reference for a, a public inquiry, uh, which uh, most and many of the victims and survivors uh, want to see. So I just wanted to briefly mention that that was a, a very important and worthwhile uh, meeting yeah and and just to, just to remind members once again that we are due to be briefed by the department on this on this issue when those questions can be raised on the 11th of march so we have a a, a forthcoming opportunity um i just sure. want to alan, alan there's a hand raised there for you alan yeah Yes, Chairman, just uh, in relation to that, uh, you know, the, 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 it was a very harrowing uh, session uh, to listen to those victims. Uh, and I'm sure they're, they're, only a, they're only a flavor uh, of, of the stories that must be out there. Uh, but uh, I know one of the gentlemen was saying that it was important that the victims helped to shape the public inquiry. And I know that uh, uh, some people were sort of wanting a public inquiry to start tomorrow. But I think that, they, they, you know, they're going to take uh, uh, three or four months, six months maybe to formulate how to go forward. Uh, and I think that is to facilitate, um, uh, you know, the victims helping to, to create the model of the public inquiry. And I think that's absolutely essential. I don't think we can go into a public inquiry that the victims don't fully buy into and fully support. I think that's very important. But just uh, just a small logistical problem. Uh, I had great difficulty, Chair, and I think maybe you had yourself, actually getting into the meeting. 
um, I, I struggled for about 15 or 20 minutes and I, 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 I don't know how I actually if, if I finally managed to get in and I think I might only have got in on audio but uh, it's maybe a different system. It wasn't the Zoom or it wasn't Starlight so it's maybe we might need to get some technical advice if uh, we're going to go into a meeting where that system is going to be used in the future but so I don't know whether any other members had any problems, but I, I certainly I struggled with it. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that is no. So that meeting specifically was organised and arranged through the offices of the uh, of Judith Gillespie, and that was the system they came up with. And um, it did it did create some difficulties. We have indicated that we we see that as a process of ongoing engagement, and we will look at different ways of doing engagements. So as we have different voices as well, I agree with both of you. I think it's absolutely essential that the victims are central to the shaping, the formulation, the direction of any public inquiry. And I think that came across loud and clear, and uh, I, I would agree with you yeah. that is. And, and there does, I'll come to you in a second, Karen, there does need to be, I think, a uh, support provided to those families so they can engage in that process on the basis of fairness and equality and, and the, to use the legal term equality of arms so that they're going in there equipped with the information and the knowledge and are engaged with in a way that allows them to input. Carol? No, I agree. I wasn't at the meeting, but um, fair play to you. Um, it sounds like a, a very powerful testimony. Chair, I just want to raise the issue uh, around the way in which the department have conducted a high level equality screening rather than a full equality impact assessment, even given their own evidence last week. Um, it's very, very clear there's going to be detrimental impacts on children and young people, older people. And I, I for the life of me, just cannot accept um, the, the way in which they've, they've conducted this. I just believe that they're undermining their own argument for additional funds to go to the right places. So I just want to put that in the record. I would like even just if we could write just a bit more um, of an explanation as why they want to choose that course. Members content with that, that we would seek further information from the department around their their, their decision making process around the quality and the screening process. Yeah, members are content. I just want to check with you, Chiara. Were you indicating there at one point in time or are you OK, Chiara Hunter? You're okay. Okay, members. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think that's that's uh, that's probably everything then that we need to deal with today. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attendance and your attention. Um, the date, time, and place of next meeting, members. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, twenty fifth of February at nine thirty a.m. via video link. Thank you, members. Take care. Slango foil. Thank you, sir. Program signed.